The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. And this full committee hearing is convening regarding identifying, preventing, and, cre and treating childhood trauma. I now want to recognize our distinguished ranking member for an introduction of a new member of our committee, uh, Mr. Thank Jordan. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'm pleased to, uh, to announce that we have uh, our newest member is Mr. Fred Keller from the great state of Pennsylvania, representing the 12th district. Um, Mr. Keller served in the General Assembly in Pennsylvania for over eight years. Um, wonderful addition to uh, our committee, and uh, maybe most importantly, he's married to uh, his wife, Kay. They have two kids, and probably most importantly, have two grandchildren. So we welcome Fred to the committee and look forward to working with him to uh, serve the great people of, uh, of our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to, to ex uh, extend a warm welcome to our newest member, Fred Keller who represents the, uh, the 12th District of Pennsylvania. During his time in the uh, state legislature, he demonstrated a commitment to open, accountable government focusing on transparency. Congressman Keller set an example by posting his personal and office expenses online while he worked to establish those standards for state government. I look forward to working with him on those and many other issues. And I'm pleased to welcome you, Congressman Keller, to our committee. Thank you very much. I will now, did you want to say something? Did you want to say something? Huh? OK, all right. I didn't want to, on your debut, I didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> I will now uh, yield myself such time to do an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's such a pleasure. Oh. Yeah. I thought he said he didn't want to. I thought he did. I, I think he did. No, you oh. got it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to, uh, to be here and serve the people of Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District and the citizens of the United States of America. I look forward to working with the committee and all the other members of Congress to have a positive impact in the work we do here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I yield myself five minutes for an opening statement. When I thought about this hearing, I could not help but think about the 1997 film of Goodwill Hunting. If you'll recall, in Goodwill Hunting, we had Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and Robin Williams. And Matt Damon played as a troubled youth. And his psychiatrist, played by Robin Williams, was trying to help him because he kept getting into trouble. You remember that? And for some reason, there is one sentence in that entire film that I shall never forget. When the psychiatrist, played by Robin Williams, went up to the young youth who had been in and out of trouble and had all kinds of problems, and he said these words. He said, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And so today we are examining a critical issue that does not get enough attention here in Congress or throughout the nation, childhood trauma. Childhood trauma is a pervasive public health issue with long-term negative health effects that cost the United States billions of dollars. In 1998, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published a landmark study that found that adults who suffered from adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, are, they, are at a much greater risk of several leading causes of death, including heart disease, lung disease, cancer, 
substance use disorder, and suicide. The study examined the effects of adverse child experiences such as abuse, neglect, or separation from a parent. And it also examined the long-term effects that these events have on children throughout the rest of their lives. The science is powerful. Traumatic experiences can injure the developing brains of children, create lifelong impairments to their ability to manage stress and regulate emotions, and significantly increase the likelihood of negative health outcomes. As we will hear today, a growing number of researchers, medical professionals, public health experts, and government officials warn that childhood trauma may be, may be one of the most consequential and costly public health issues facing our nation today. The CDC recently estimated that cases of substantiated child maltreatment in 20, uh, 2015 alone will generate consequences that will cost the United States $428 billion. As staggering as that may sound, the CDC warns that this estimate likely undercounts the true cost to our nation because it examined only some of the types of trauma that children experience. The good news, and the reason we are holding this hearing today, is that childhood trauma is preventable and treatable. The effects of traumatic experiences can be identified. Damage can be healed. And children who have experienced trauma can come, become thriving and productive adults. To do this, we need a comprehensive federal approach that recognizes the severe impact of childhood trauma and prioritize prevention and treatment. I applaud the efforts of dedicated professionals at the CDC and other agencies to address childhood trauma. However, efforts at the federal level are still severely underfunded, and they do, do not provide the comprehensive whole child approach we need to combat this crisis. Childhood trauma is a nationwide public health issue associated with an epidemic of negative health consequences. For example, in 2017, substance use abuse disorder, use disorder, and suicide took approximately 150,000 lives in this nation and reduced life expectancy for the third year in a row. The federal government should be providing national leadership and resources to combat this public health epidemic. Some states and localities are imp implementing promising programs to help prevent and treat childhood trauma that can inform federal solutions. State and local health agencies are on the front lines of the childhood trauma crisis. They are confronting many of the negative health consequences that trauma produces. Sadly, I see this every day in my city of Baltimore, where far, far too many of our community's children are suffering severe trauma, including experiencing or witnessing violence or losing parents to violence, incarceration or substance use. As we will hear today, today and state and local agencies are pioneering innovative interventions to address the crisis. And I want to thank all of our partners in this effort. The Government Accountability Office has highlighted several of these promising efforts. However, it has also warned that states are facing limitations in funding, technical capacity and personnel to address this complex and multifaceted problem. I often tell my staff that when people come into my office who are troubled, 
that they must remember that many of the problems that they suffer today started when they were a child. Started when they were a child. And there are two paths of life, I tell them. There's one path that is your destiny. The other path is development. And you've got to have both. And so as a nation, we have a significant economic incentive and more importantly, a profound moral imperative to ensure that our children have the opportunity to thrive and succeed. That is why we are having this hearing today. And I want to thank all of our witnesses. Everybody is here. And now I am pleased to yield to our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first thank our witnesses, um, Mr. Miller, Ms. Martin, Mr. Killebrew, Ms. Aviles Rigg. Um, your stories are not easy ones to tell, and it is brave of you to come here today and share them with us. In particular, I want to thank you, Ms. Martin. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years since, uh, since that tragic day in Colorado. The topic of today's hearing is an important one. Childhood trauma is something we must all strive to better understand, work to prevent when possible, and treat when discovered. Our children are, after all, our most precious gift. The research shows that traumatic childhood events actually alter brain development, as the chairman said, and are linked to higher rates, heart disease, mental health issues that lead dramatically to increased rates of suicide. Childhood trauma also leads to increased drug use. The drug use often results in a life of addiction, which itself results in trauma for the children of those affected. We now know that devastation of the opioid epidemic is one of the most significant factors contributed, contributing to childhood trauma. My home state of Ohio has the second highest opioid overdose, uh, overdose rate, overdose death rate in the country. These overdoses are ripping apart families and forcing children to cope with unspeakable grief. I want to thank the chairman for inviting Mr. Charles Patterson from Clark County, Ohio to testify on the second panel to shed more light on these issues and what Ohio is doing to try to combat them. The opioid problem has affected all of our districts, especially our colleague Carol Miller's district, which has been called the epicenter of the opioid epidemic. I appreciate all of Carol's work in addressing this problem. I also want to take a minute to recognize another member of our committee, Dr. Green is not with, yet with us. This is the first term in Congress, um, and in his first term from the moment he joined the committee, He's worked tirelessly to address issues related to veterans suffering from PTSD. And I appreciate the chairman's work on this. I know you and Mr. Green have worked together, and I, I do appreciate the, uh, the bipartisan nature in, of, of addressing this, uh, looking to see what we can do to address this problem. Recently, the Subcommittee on National Security held a hearing addressing military suicides, as well as the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs prevention efforts. This was due in no small part to Mr. Green's passion for tackling this issue. While DOD and the VA are collaborating to provide access to mental health treatment, Congress has a responsibility to oversee this process and ensure our veterans are getting everything they need. I'd also like to thank the CDC and HHS, in particular Dr. Horry, for her testimony today and the extensive amount of time their teams have provided to the committee staff to learn more about this critical issue. I hope we will continue to do this on a bipartisan basis. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for traveling here and for sharing their difficult stories. It is uh, courageous of you to do that. And just mention that I may have to step out from time to time. We have a uh, subpoena markup on uh, over in judiciary. So, uh, but I'll try to be here for as much of the testimony as I possibly can. You don't need to be there for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, or, or Mr. Mr. Conley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, uh, I yield back. I, I want to thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Jordan. I too want to applaud Mr. Green. He has worked tirelessly with us to address the issue of suicide in our military. And uh, I want you to know that we will work in a bipartisan way. I got a little bit emotional when I was reading my opening statement uh, because I know where I could have been. Uh, I was placed in special ed from kindergarten through the sixth grade. Told me I'd never be able to read or write. And I ended up a Phi Beta Kappa and a lawyer. So it's emotional for me, this childhood thing. Is and I've often said it's and, not. And a pretty good chairman. <laughs> and I've often said it's not the deed that we do to the children, it's the memory. It's not the deed, it's the memory. And so now 
I would like to welcome our first panel of witnesses. The men and women who comprise our first panel have each suffered devastating personal trauma, and they have turned the unspeakable pain they endured into passion to do their purpose. I'm grateful for their presence here today. Uh, on panel one, we have William Killebrew, uh, who is the founder of the Will William Killebrew Foundation, Kriana Rigg, who is, who is a survivor and activist, Justin Miller, who is the Deputy Executive Director of Objective Zero Foundation, and Heather Martin, Executive Director and Co-Founder, The Rebels Project. Uh, if you would all, well, you're already rising, so would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You may be seated. Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. And uh, the, I want to let all of our witnesses know that your microphones are sensitive, so please speak directly into them. And what we're going to do is we're allowing, because of the sensitive nature of your testimony, we're allowing each of you eight, eight minutes or less, or less, did you hear me? Or less. Um, uh, you don't have to take it all. And so, um, but I beg you to stay within it and watch the lights. The lights will come on and it'll indicate, you know, you've got a, a, a yellow light and then you have a red light. And then I'm gonna have to bang this gavel. You don't want me to do that. So I, and I don't wanna do that, all right? Mr. Killebrew, thank you. Our values and beliefs drive our decision-making, actions, and behavior. What we say, what we do, how we behave can be directly linked to what we value and believe. But what if, what if what we value and believe or what mattered to us the most was either lost, stolen, withheld from us, or even destroyed? That is what happened to my sister and brothers and me on the morning of July 2nd, 1984, just days away from our 35th anniversary. Home alone, I woke up to my mother Jacqueline screaming. I slowly rose from my bed and looked out of our living room window and saw mom, Jacqueline's ex-boyfriend, dragging her and my 12-year-old brother down the street toward our home. I didn't think much of it. We had lived under his terror for months, so I went to find something to eat. Eventually, my mom banged on the door and, op and I opened it. She ran toward the window, screaming to the neighbors for help, call the police. My brother stood against the wall with one foot glued to the floor and one against the wall. Mom's ex-boyfriend took out a black gun and loaded it, bullet by bullet. He wasted no time. He walked over to my mom. She frantically turned to him. He pointed the gun to her face, and she yelled as loud as she could yell, no. He pulled the trigger. He then went to my brother, Tony, put the gun up to his head and pulled the trigger. He then walked over to me and squatted with the gun to my head in front of me. I looked down the barrel and into his eyes, and I begged, fast as I can, please don't kill me, I'll do anything. He didn't respond, so I looked up to the ceiling, held my hands tightly and begged, God, please don't let him kill me, I will do anything. An eternity had passed. He pulled the gun back, stood, and walked to the other side of the room. After pacing, he, that, he said that I could leave. But where was I going? This was our family living room. With my little shorts on and no shoes, I slowly rose from my seat and put one foot after another through the threshold of our door. After getting further away from our home, I ran as fast as I could, screaming my mom's words, call the police. A three-hour standoff, two murders, one suicide. We never returned to that rental home in Capitol Heights, Maryland again. A loving family member trying to make sense of it all patted me on my shoulder and told me before the funeral, baby, you're gonna have to forget about it. My grandmother packed what photos she had, locked them in a black and gold chest, and we all tried to forget. I took that strategy to the fifth grade, trying to imagine a world much different than what I had experienced. Three years later in seventh grade, I could not bear the pain anymore. I woke up one morning and I put my book bag on and headed off to school. 
I stood on our neighborhood bridge on North Capitol Street just 22 blocks away from my seat today, having decided to take William Kellebrew me out of the equation. I had lost every piece of dignity I had as a child. My voice, my soul, and my purpose, empty. I was one decision away from relief, but I made it to school. My assistant principal, Mr. Charles C. Christian, called my grandmother and I was hospitalized for 30 days. When I was discharged, I met my first ever therapist, Christine Pierre. Instead of having the session in her office, she took me to the cafeteria at Children's Hospital and asked me, what do you want for lunch? On a one-to-one, -one, I said to myself, I'm gonna clean you out. I started at the ice cream machine and I must have built the biggest ice cream cone you can build on this side of Earth. No adult had ever listened so intently to what I had to say. It was the beginning of my healing journey and my first introduction to the mental health system. 30 years later, I sit here reminded of the long journey of hope, healing, and resilience. I stand today alongside my fellow survivors with a sense of purpose, dignity, and respect for the shoulders I stand on and a sense that healing is absolutely possible. Two professors from my university, the University of the District of Columbia, where I earned my first degree, started the William Calibre Foundation in 2008. They recognized my passion for service and invested in supporting victims of crime and my career as a victim and survivor advocate. Today, I have taken my passion to my role as a director for the Office of Youth and Trauma Services at the Baltimore City Health Department, where my mom was born in the 50s. I am afforded the opportunity to work alongside brilliant and dedicated colleagues and under the leadership of the city's health commissioner, Dr. Leticia Jaraza to continue to build a trauma-informed and responsive city at the forefront of a national violence, trauma, opioid, and substance use epidemic claiming precious lives each day. We have trained over 3,100 city employees, community members, small businesses, and nonprofits in a trauma-informed approach, and now we're working to ensure a longer-term impact with solid metrics in, in place. The journey for me, like so many children, young African-American males, and families I engage in Baltimore and DC and across the country is not an easy journey of recovery. My grandmother who is sitting here today said to me as a little boy, if you can handle your mom and brother's death, you can handle anything. I didn't know what she meant by that age, by, by that at age 10 or 21, but I held on to her faith because I did not have much growing up. I had hoped that she knew what she was talking about. When I first started my job in Baltimore, I met a young boy around the age of seven who had been shot in his head. He was playing in his neighborhood as nothing had happened. He told me his story, but what I took away was that while lying in the hospital fighting for his life, he said that he was trying to stay alive for his family. Families cannot be, be left to grapple with the aftermath of trauma. We need sound support through leadership and governance, effective policies and practices, mental health and substance use supports and treatments, a knowledge base in addressing trauma, and the caring and compassion that I know we are all capable of delivering that can reduce the stigma of experiencing trauma, mental health, and substance use challenges. Trauma can strip us of our values, our voice, and our dignity. Trauma can be dehumanizing, but our role as survivors, as human beings, is to bring humanity back into its space. That is what the United States Congress has done today. Thank you to the Honorable Congressman Elijah Cummings and to uh, the Honorable Congressional colleagues and staff of the Committee on Oversight and Reform. And I've always wanted to say this. I yield my time, my time to my grandmother who worked on her job for 38 years, was late less than 10 times, and never used an alarm clock with a singular mission, to give our family a chance at life. Please just stand and be recognized to my grandmother behind me. Will you stand, please? Please stand up. Thank you. Thank you for your statement, and thank you for recognizing that beautiful lady that just stood up. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Ms. Rigg. Thank you. I would first like to thank Congressman Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan and the members of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform for this opportunity to speak about the lasting effects of childhood trauma. I am 28 years old and from Helena, Montana, where I have lived for most of my life. I am Portuguese, Filipino, and Hispanic. My family is all from the Hawaiian Islands and moved to the mainland before I was born in hopes to give my mother, who became pregnant with me at the age of 16, a fresh start and a chance at a better life. 
Both my grandmother and my mother are victims of abuse. Neither of them had ever received help or justice for their trauma. In fact, abuse became something that wasn't acknowledged in our family because it was considered normal or the price you paid to be supported and have a place to live. My mother's first marriage was to a man who physically and verbally abused her. Although she tried to shield my siblings and I from it, we witnessed her being hit, shoved, and even sat on by him in order to prevent her from being able to leave. After several escape attempts, she finally got us away from him. I was nine years old at the time, and we settled down in a new town where she met her second husband, Raul. Raul was kind to my mom and seemed to love my siblings and I. However, as I got older, he changed. I was 11 years old when Raul began abusing me. It started with him groping my body in a sexual way and pretending he mistook me for my mother. At the time, I didn't know that this was a form of sexual abuse, and I didn't know how to tell my mom. I didn't want to be the one to break up our family after all we had already been through. As the abuse continued, I began to distance myself from him, which made him lash out at me in violent ways. He once had beat me so badly that our neighbors had heard my screams and called the police. This was my first open case with the Department of Family Services. They came and took pictures of the bruises all over my body and Raul was arrested, but unfortunately the case was closed and he was back in our home by the next week. By the time I was 12 years old, I was so depressed, I had stopped eating and was beginning to self-harm. Still unable to tell my mom what was going on, she became worried and had me admitted into a children's hospital. There I was diagnosed with bipolar depression and heavily medicated for three months until I was behaving well enough to go home. I was released and just before my 13th birthday, Raul raped me. This time I did tell my mom and we went to the police. I was examined at a hospital and Raul was arrested the next day. They found him with scratches all over his face and body just as I had described as I fought to be free. All of the evidence of what he had done was there, but he knew my mom could not live with herself knowing she had allowed me to get hurt. He knew she was vulnerable from the day that he met us and he manipulated her once again into believing I was just a bad child, trying to ruin her happy life for my own selfish reasons. Eventually, she was in denial that he had ever done anything wrong and I was taken by DFS and placed in group homes I was on juvenile probation, and then I lived in foster care before being placed in the Florence Crittenden home for pregnant teens. I was 14 years old and four months pregnant when I arrived. It was at Florence Crittenden that I was finally treated for the traumatic experiences that I had survived. I attended therapy sessions, and I learned that more than half the girls living there at the time were also survivors of sexual and or violent crimes. After my case had gone to trial and Raul was sentenced to prison, I was able to go back home with my mother. Everything had happened so fast, and now I had a baby to take care of. Mine, as well as my mother's mental health, was put on the back burner. We did what we knew best, and we moved forward. Raul was unable to hurt me anymore, but I still lived in fear every day. I had a hard time developing healthy relationships as an adult. I had major trust issues with every man that came into my life, including my third stepfather. I was 22 years old when I met my husband, Jason, and I was still having night terrors regularly. My husband would have to calm me down and help me back to sleep, and it took me years to be calm in my own house and not jump every time he walked up behind me. We are now raising three children together, and like any parent, I fear that the worst could happen to them. I try to have open conversations about abuse with them so that they can recognize it if they experience or witness it and help them understand how they can tell someone I am determined to end the cycle of abuse in my family with me. I am now involved in national advocacy work for young parents and survivors of adverse childhood experiences through National Crittenden. I have held group meetings at my local Crittenden agency where I share my story and give the participants a safe, judgment-free space to talk openly about their experiences, and I try to support them in their journey to heal healing. Looking back, I feel as though I slipped through the cracks in the agencies that are designed to protect children from trauma. I was labeled as a troubled youth when really I just needed someone to recognize I was being hurt. Sexual abuse is an epidemic in our nation. Studies have found that up to 89% of sexual abuse victims are female, and of all the females raped in the US, 41% are under the age of 18. For youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system, 
the girls' rate of sexual abuse is four times higher than the boys in juvenile justice, and the girls' rate of complex trauma is nearly twice as high. What Congress can do to help is make sure that schools, foster homes, group homes, and juvenile justice facilities provide services that support girls in healing from experiences that caused trauma they faced, and make a change from just looking at what we did and ask first, what happened to us? Hundreds of thousands of girls will and have faced similar experiences as I did, and they each deserve a chance to be valued, respected, and supported when asking for help and healing. They deserve a chance to live happy and healthy lives. Thank you for listening to my story. I hope it will provide insight to this subject and a sense of urgency to provide more resources to survivors of traumatic experiences. Thank you very much. Mr. Miller. My name is Justin Miller. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. I was medically retired after serving over 11 years in the military, and I'm now serving our veterans and their loved ones as a civilian. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and co-founder of the Objective Zero Foundation. We are a 501c3 that has created a free app that instantly and anonymously connects veterans, service members, their family members, and caregivers to one of almost a thousand of our trained suicide prevention ambassadors in a time of need. I faced many challenges growing up as a child of divorced parents. I was exposed to many things at a young age that I shouldn't have been. I had several instances of childhood trauma that I knew weren't normal to most, but I hadn't realized the impact they had on my life until I became an adult and started seeking help to deal with my PTSD and depression. <clears throat> In the fall of 2018, I went to a program called Save a Warrior, where they gave me the adverse childhood experience test. It was then I realized, or I remembered playing doctor with these girls as a kid. There were three sisters who lived nearby me. The middle sister was old enough to be developing, but the youngest sister was, was my age. The middle sister would have us get undressed and play doctor with each other you know, at the age of four. I was later threatened by their father when he found out and punished by my parents. Then other inappropriate moments with an adult came a couple years later. My best friend accidentally shot and killed himself when we were in the fourth grade. I was supposed to be at his house that night. By doing group therapy in school, I mentioned that and how things could have been different. Someone then said it was my fault because I didn't go over to his house and that always stuck with me. My dad went to prison for three years when I was seven. I would always get laughed at because my dad didn't make it to career day at school. When my dad finally did get out of prison, I would do anything to have that bond with him and gain his approval. At 11 years old, I was introduced to marijuana and alcohol in the same day by my dad. He wanted me to do the things he was doing with him so that I wouldn't tell on him for doing them. When I was in the seventh grade, my 18-year-old uncle hung himself in the basement of his house. I was a wreck. My teachers could tell something was wrong and sent me to the office. I started to open up to my counselor and told her what had happened. She asked me if I could say one last thing to him. What would it be and how did I feel? I told her I didn't know what to feel. My dad always told me, boys don't cry, that if I wanted something to cry about, he would give me something to cry about. Before I could even think about it, the lunch bell rang. She said, well, there's the lunch bell. You should probably go. Think about what it is I said, and she walked me to the door. After my traumatic childhood, I tried to stay numb and intoxicated all the time. During SAWS, when I realized I was repeating the cycle with my children, and then decided it was time to break that cycle. I went to war for the first time at the age of 20. I spent a total of 27 months in Iraq between two deployments. During that time, I was involved in many explosions, causing back injuries and traumatic brain injuries. I saw things that one should never see, leave me with nightmares, depression, and anxiety. I was also left behind in a house during a mission and had to physically fight to get back to my men. I was later punished and pushed to another platoon to save them. This left me with trust and abandonment issues. Two deployments had me feeling completely broken and like a piece of me will always be missing no matter how hard I try to put myself back together. One of the major events that sticks in my mind was 11 November of 04 when a V-bid 
killed Staff Sergeant Huey. A young boy and his sister were also killed in front of me. I also had to shoot a warning shot at a man that was carrying his son that was critically wounded and later died. That warning shot crushed me. I felt like I took everything away from that man and it destroyed my life. Not long before that day, those two kids were playing in an alley and we were on a dismounted patrol. As we were walking towards them, they grabbed our hands and started pulling us in a different direction. We called the interpreter up after setting security up and found out that there was a bomb buried in the middle of the road that we were about to walk over. And these two little kids, with no worry of their own safety, pulled us aside and let us know, saving all of our lives. <clears throat> it has been torture knowing that I wasn't able to do the same for them in return. That specific incident changed me or changed things for me as a father for years to come. I believe that if I wasn't able to help those kids, how would I ever be a good father to my own? For years, I tried to stay distant to my two young kids. I had a short fuse with them. When they would cry, it would trigger old memories from war and I'd become angry. I made myself believe that they would be better off without me. However, Saul taught me that the best way to help others is to help yourself. Once you learn to process and understand that childhood trauma wasn't your fault, you then begin the healing process. This healing process will affect the seven generations in the past and seven generations ahead. Once I realized it was okay to talk about what I've been through and started dealing with my PTSD, my relationship with my kids started to change. I now make an effort to make time for my children and connect with them over things that they're passionate about, i.e. coaching their softball and baseball teams. I also make it an effort to remind my children that they are enough, that I'm proud of them, and that I fully support them in the path they choose. I want them to know that they should never feel that they need to do anything in life to gain my approval. I make it a point to start conversations with them about random topics so I can get an insight on the people they're becoming. This also makes them more comfortable with sparking up future conversations with me. My hope is for more veterans to open up about the struggles they're dealing with day to day so we can end this suicide epidemic. My nonprofit, Objective Zero, was started after I almost took my own life. I felt like I had no one to talk to that would understand what I was going through at the time. Because of my darkest moments, we created an app to do just that. Nearly a thousand people have signed up to lend a non-judgmental ear and talk through the hard times with those who have dedicated their lives to this country. It is going to require a culture shift for us to see a difference. People need to quit feeling ashamed and embarrassed about their trauma. By not talking about our trauma, it gives that event power over you. The more we talk about these issues, the more people will feel open to asking for help and talking about their struggles. What made the difference to me is when I was going to church looking for an answer and I was having it down right out with God and I was mad at him. And uh, I heard clear as day, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Look at everything I pulled you through. What, gives it, what good is it to know an answer to a secret if you keep it a secret? Share your struggles to give others hope and strength to push forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. I mean, sorry, Ms. Martin. Thank you so much for listening to my story. On April 20th in 1999, I was a senior at Columbine High School when two gunmen killed 12 students, a teacher, and then killed themselves. Today, I'm approaching my seventh year as a high school English teacher, and I'm also the executive director of a nonprofit called The Rebels Project, named after the Columbine Rebels. It supports survivors of other, of other mass traumas, it took me a little over 10 years to confront and reflect on how the shootings at my high school impacted me, but I've learned some valuable lessons. One that, one that sometimes needs reminding is that trauma recovery has no timeline. Another is that we can help by providing children with the tools to support them as they build resilience. During the shooting, I was barricaded in a small office with 59 other students while the gunmen rampaged the school. Three hours after barricading, we were escorted out by SWAT team members and passed the bodies of two students who were shot outside, Danny Royball and Rachel Scott. 
Much later, I learned that the SWAT team, thinking there were still gunmen loose in the building, decided to save us instead of seeking out Dave Sanders, who eventually bled to death just a few rooms down the hall from where we hid. Sometimes these details are enough for the average person to be horrified enough to keep their judgment of my recovery to themselves. However, many times I still find myself having to justify the depth and complexity of my trauma and why I struggled for so long. Later that evening, I arrived home physically uninjured, but a completely different person. My sister, a freshman in 1999, hugged me in the driveway, feeling grateful and guilty that she got out of the school relatively quickly. I graduated and went off to college where I experienced being blindsided by a trigger for the first, but certainly not the last time. You see, what I didn't remember was that the fire alarm had been going off while I was trapped in the office. So when the fire alarm sounded in my English class to signal a drill, instead of evacuating like everyone else, I started sobbing uncontrollably. I tried to advocate for myself to my professors and was told I still had to write my final English paper about school violence or fail the class, even after confessing that I had been at Columbine. Uh, I ended up failing that class. <laughs> Um, and actually, I failed English class twice in college, which um, makes my students now laugh. My first semesters of college were some of the hardest times in my life. After being surrounded by loved ones and by a support system made up of people who understood what I had gone through, I was now embarrassed, shameful, and isolated. I was also really angry, not surprising to anyone who knows anything about grief or trauma. For me, the manifestations of that trauma were that I developed an eating disorder and I tried drugs. The drugs were fairly short-lived and lucky for me, they weren't addictive. As for my sister, she just celebrated three years clean and sober and will continue to fight each day for her recovery through her trauma and through her drug abuse. I did attend formal therapy and received validation from my therapist, someone my family was lucky enough to afford, that it was okay that I was traumatized even a year later. Silly me, I thought I should have been over it in months. Eventually I dropped out of college, completely, and I worked full time. For anniversaries, I went out of town to avoid the memories. Much like many of my students feel now when they're reminded of the traumas they've experienced. Once I had a student who stopped coming to class because the anniversary of their traumatic experience was approaching. Later, they told me that they had to build up enough courage to come talk to me about it because they were so embarrassed. I imagine this is similar to how I felt when I attempted to talk to my college professors. Other tragedies also impacted me. 9-11 sent me into hysterics and prompted severe flashbacks. Virginia Tech resulted in several debilitating anxiety attacks and I embarrassingly had to call into work. I mean, that was even eight years after the attacks at Columbine. Though the company I worked for was pretty understanding, I could tell that there were frustrations when I couldn't show up. In 2009, 10 years after the shooting, I reconnected with people who knew what my struggles entailed. As a result of these renewed connections um, and acceptance I felt when returning for the anniversary, I went back to college. At first, my brother had to come to campus with me to help me navigate and feel comfortable, but eventually I was a full-time student again, majoring in English and working toward my secondary teaching license. Now my struggles were mostly in math because I teach English. <laughs> After co-founding the nonprofit in 2012 and having the opportunity to travel and connect with other survivors across the country, I began to see more clearly the ripples of trauma and the similarities that exist no matter the circumstances of the event. Columbine and my story are often sensationalized, one of the reasons I imagine I'm here today. But the feelings I experienced in the months and years following Columbine, anger, loneliness, isolation, and embarrassment are not unique to mass shooting survivors. For my students who have been traumatized in other ways, no less valid or less seriously, they are sometimes too young to be able to reflect on why they are reacting the way they are. Survivors are blindsided by triggers all the time. Right now, the survivors in my support network who are from more recent shootings are asking about fireworks and how long it will be until they stop diving for cover. For children and for my students, they may be blindsided while reading a short story or they might tune out and stop listening to instructions. They may need choices of topics to research, to write about, or to study in order to avoid their freakouts. I've also heard countless stories of survivors trying drugs and alcohol to help them numb the pain and blur the memories. And not many of my students' families can afford therapy like my family could. The school therapist's schedules is always jam-packed. 
And many of those who could benefit from therapy are embarrassed about it because of the stigma. And many times they've convinced themselves or have been convinced that whatever they're going through doesn't warrant therapy. I also consider how triggering events might impact my students. Would they react like me and avoid talking about it? Would they react in anger and in defiance? These questions and concepts are explored during trauma-informed professional development so teachers can best support the needs of their students. As a teacher, I wear many, many hats, but I'm not always qualified to provide the support needed. Schools need more counselors, more social workers, and more psychologists. They need programs that teach children how to build resilience, how to avoid, or how, I'm sorry, how to use coping skills, and how to practice self-care. At my school, we average one counselor to every 400 students. Increasing these services will not only help children who have experienced trauma, but also help provide the skills necessary to build resilience before a traumatic event. Trauma is in fact a universal part of the human experience, and because of this universal experience, it's critical that we address this underlying issue that connects many of our current problems. Trauma is connected to suicide, to abuse, to drug addiction, and even to classroom management issues. Please consider these needs in order to ensure that all children who need mental health support in schools and in communities have access, and not just after a traumatic event, but before as well. In closing, and I understand that this might be really hard to do, but please do not compare our traumas and our experiences on this panel. Our stories and experiences are very different, but trauma is trauma across the board. Thank you very much. Let me. Um... Before we go into questions, I want to be clear. I want the witnesses to be clear and the witnesses coming up to be clear. Um, the, you will see members going in and out. Uh, it's no disrespect to you. Uh, it's because on Wednesdays and Thursdays is when we have uh, our hearings and m all members that I know of sit on at least two committees. And a lot of it's in, con in conflict, they're conflicting with each other, their votes. And so we want to make sure you're clear. It's out of, not out of disrespect, but you know, we try to do more than one thing at, once, at a time. Um, I also want to uh, let the members know uh, that to ensure that we have time to hear from all of our witnesses and out of respect for the highly personal stories that the members of our first panel have just shared with us, we are limiting questioning to this panel to a total, listen up, a total of 10 minutes, total. Uh, I'm, uh, and I, I just want to also thank our ranking member um, for his cooperation in working this out. Um, he, he, you have been extremely helpful, and I, I deeply appreciate it, uh, all that you've done to help us out. Um, with that, I'm going to have, and let me show you how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm going to just have one question, and then I'm going to go and to the other side, I'm going to flip back and forth until we've exhausted 10 minutes on both sides. All right? You got that? So if you're going to ask a question, we need to know that you're going to ask one. And if we don't get to you, don't be mad. We're just trying to respect our witnesses. All right? All right. I'm going to be quick. Uh, Mr. Killebrew, uh, I want to thank you for for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes and I, of course, represent Baltimore, and we're always trying to figure out ways to help young people and go through what they're going through and difficulties. In your experience as both a trauma survivor and as a practitioner working with trauma traumatized youth in Baltimore, uh, let me ask you this. How critical is expanding services to help prevent childhood trauma and support children who have experienced trauma uh, to enabling Baltimore to reduce the violence in our city? I think it's a, extremely important and I think that building on the strengths of our young people is important. I think realizing that uh, our young people have uh, um, the innate ability to, to, to succeed. Um, I, I actually was once in um, special education as well and I didn't believe that I could get out there. Failed many times in, in college and high school. Didn't graduate, got my GED. Uh, but here I am leading a public health approach in the city that uh, my mother lived in and um, was born in. And um, I think that believing in our kids and modeling what resiliency looks like, I think is an important thing in our programs uh, that we have at the health department and across the city, ensuring that they're consistent trusting 
uh, uh, programs and that they have the metrics behind them to show that they actually work. Um, and then believing in community, that community has the ability to do that. So the partnerships and collaboration is part of a trauma-informed approach. So collaboration is really important all, all across the board. I now yield to uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, I just want to thank, um, thank the witnesses for your, your courage and your story and for your service. Mr. Miller, your service to our country, all of you, your service to students, and, um, the impact you're having on people and to your families. Um, we had this wonderful grandmother introduced, but I think we got other family members for the other wit. I know we have a husband here and Mr. Miller and maybe Miss Martin. If you have family here, I think the chairman would probably like for them to stand up too, so oh, we could all recognize definitely. them. If you have, if, if you all, any of you all have family here, please. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Very well. Who's that? Ms. Wasserman Schultz, for one question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Ms. Martin, thank you for, Ms. Martin, I'm over here. I'm over here. <laughs> yeah, it's a very broad dais. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I, I represent the community directly adjacent to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. So our community has been through really a very similar trauma and we're dealing with the aftermath of students who also survived, and there'll be many years that 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 is some that, uh, those are challenges that we're going to have to help them through. So that your your being here is really important. Um, and I could hear the resilience uh, through the pain in, in your story. Um, I, I I have not experienced trauma myself, so it's it's di difficult for me to to directly sympathize. I can certainly empathize, but. First of all, it's, it's incredible that you became a teacher, that you, that you put yourself professionally in a school environment and that that's where you go to work every day and are nurturing our, our young people. So I wanna ask you your, your, my question based on your experience as a teacher. Can you share more about why you think it's so important that we provide training and resources to enable teachers to recognize trauma and support children who have experienced it so they don't get the reaction that you got from your college professor. And like I said, I know that we're struggling to make sure that we can do that for our students in Broward County as well. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I have been down to speak to the students several times. Thank you. Um, so they're, they're hanging in there. Yeah. They're, <laughs> they're right where they, they should, should be. Absolutely. Um, to your question, I. At my school, we have an extremely diverse population, so our um, professional development sometimes vary from what I hear goes on at different schools, but it's so important for teachers at every school to take part in these professional developments, and they need to be meaningful because professional developments at teachers are sometimes, for teachers are like, just check the box, like, oh, I have yeah. to go to this meeting and right. sit there and listen. Um, but they need to be aware, I think, that because a student is acting out in class or um, challenging you, there's a good chance that it's not, it's not you, it's not something that you're doing, it's something that they've been through. And it's so critical that teachers understand that and reflect on that because the ripples of that can, I mean, it can change a child's life. If you can connect with a child, I mean, if they're acting up, like instead of writing them a referral or sending them out, you just say, are you okay today? Yeah. What's going on today? And chances are they're gonna open up. Um, I tell them my story every year. And uh, the purpose for that was I just wanted them to take like lockdown yep. drills seriously. <laughs> but <laughs> the unintended consequence of that was that they opened up to me about their stories. And then I was able to put them in touch with the appropriate resources. Um, so teachers and, and really anybody in the education field really needs to be educated on trauma-informed instruction and what that looks like and what that means. Thank you Mr. Very much. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller, thank you for your service, but more importantly, thank you for signing up to help the people who have served and the people who've gone through experiences like all of you have shared. Could you just briefly tell us a little bit more about this app that you've worked on that could help other people who are contemplating taking their own lives? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so the night that I almost committed suicide, um, it was four o'clock in the morning. So I'm 
you don't want to be a burden to somebody. I had no clue who to talk to. Um, so I just tried to do what I was always told, was to suck it up, drink water, and drive on. <clears throat> so uh, after calling the VA, telling him that I almost killed myself, was placed on hold, scheduled an appointment for two days later. Um, I just felt like I was completely abandoned. Um, a phone call uh, from an old leader lasted about six hours, and he kind of just gave me a different purpose and a direction. Um, so we got my story published to, you know, let others know that they weren't alone. Um, the app idea was given to us. Uh, originally, it was like Yelp for veterans, um, but while doing research, found out most veterans, uh, when they decide to commit suicide, to do it within the first five minutes. So we're like, we don't have time for them to try to find a resource, call, be put on hold, sent to voicemail. Um, we're like, we need something that's instant. And people that are active duty are afraid to go get help, you know, because if you get you know, diagnosed with PTSD, uh, you're not deployable. Once you're not deployable, they don't need you anymore. So we're like, you know, we need something that's instant and anonymous, uh, something that they can just pick up a phone, touch of a button, be connected to somebody who cares, not there for a paycheck, somebody who just wants to listen to you and let you know that you're loved and how important you are and how needed you are. Um, so right now we have almost 1,000 trained uh, volunteers that are there just to answer a phone. Um, we have over 4,000 people that are using the app. Uh, like I said, touch of a button, voice, video, or text. Uh, they can instantly connect with somebody. The app's live, so if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you open the app, you can see who's available to answer that call. Can you, can you tell us the name of the app before I yield back? Uh, Objective Zero. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Miller. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Connolly. No, it's okay. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to say it all for you. Uh, I've been to a lot of hearings. This is the bravest panel I've ever heard. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kelly. If there's nobody on this, I'm sorry. Is there anybody on? Ms. Kelly. I just want to thank all of you. Uh, first of all, I used to work at Crittenden Care and Counseling Center in Illinois. Believe it or not, and uh, part of that was I worked with parents who had the propensity to abuse their kids to stop that cycle. Uh, Mr. Miller, I too wanted to thank you. Uh, for your service and your commitment to this country. What kind of uh, supports do you think would help other parents suffering from the effects of trauma to break the cycle with their own children? I know you, you know, have saw, but everyone's not, you know, a military person, but what would you recommend? Um, my recommendation is to make the ACE exam more common. Um, it needs to be given to children in school, you know, by a counselor, so that way the, the teachers and the counselors understand, you know, why a student may be acting out the way they are. And along with parents, I had no idea all the trauma that I went through. I just thought that I had a normal childhood um, until I had this test, and then um, everything started coming back to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the ACE exam, they say if you score a four or higher, you're like 50% more likely to commit suicide than your average average citizen, um, along with the drug addictions and all that. So I think having even the parents and the families know and understand that, you know, this stuff happened, people might have just thought you're doing it and you're being a troubled child, you know, years ago, but now if they would have just said, well, you know, let's look at the root of why he's doing these things, you know, why were these girls even having these ideas? Who was doing this to them? Where did they learn this from? You know, instead of just jumping straight to the conclusion of you were doing something wrong and punishing them, you know, try to figure it out, talk to them, and then you let them know that, you know, this isn't your fault. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have happened. But we're going to talk about this. We're open about it. Let's work through it as a, as a family um, just to give them a better understanding. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Heiss. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to reiterate and say thank you, each of you, for being here today and sharing your stories. Uh, and for family and friends who are here as well. And Ms. Martin, you are so right that uh, every story is different. Um, my background, I was a pastor for over 25 years before coming to Congress and cannot tell you how many people over the years, and personally, we have been involved with in trying to help through multi multiple different kinds of traumatic experiences. And hearing your stories, 
this morning, quite frankly, it's difficult for me just in uh, reliving so many other experiences and precious people's lives that we've personally been, been engaged with. And every time, to be honest, I felt so inadequate and I cannot... I mean, there's just like in every person's life that we dealt with, it was just uh, crying out to God for wisdom to help to help these people in whatever circumstance it was. And so thank you to each of you. Mr. Miller, I do want to uh, specifically ask you, you mentioned uh, personally an encounter you had with the Lord. And I, you know, I, I, I look just personally going back and back in the 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 90s i believe it is only about 7% of americans said they had no religious affiliation now that's well over 20% uh, and i th- i think that's rather significant i'm just curious um how important your faith was in dealing with and finding some healing from the traumatic experience you went through Um, if it wasn't for my faith, uh, none of this would happen. Uh, I was my leadership, or my friend Chris tried to convince me to write my story, and I procrastinated. I didn't think I had a story. I just thought that I was in the infantry and did my job. Um, so it wasn't until my mother-in-law asked me to come to church, and I was like, "Why? You know, you know, what type of God would actually let this crap going on in you in the world? What type of God would let me see this stuff and survive?" type of God would let my friends die and me make it back and have to suffer and remember this all my life. Um, And I was having it down right out with him. I was cussing him out and I heard it clear as day, you know, and once I heard that, I'm like, I I have to share my story. I mean, how do you have someone tell you that with nobody around and then not go home and do it? Um, And that's when I realized that, you know, our stories provides healing for others. It lets others know that what they're going through is not, you know, they're not alone, that there's uh, others out there that have experienced it. So, you know, my religion has been key. It's helped keep my family together. Um, It's given me the belief that if you just wake up every day and put one foot in front of another, that things will eventually work out as long as you don't quit. Thank you very much, Ms. Presley. This will be our Mr. last. Mr. Chairman, can I finish my five minutes? Yeah, no, you don't have five minutes. You weren't here at the beginning. I, I limited it. We, were, we have, uh, so that you'll be clear, we gave each side 10 minutes, and, each, and I asked members out of due respect for them, and the, this was already worked out. And, okay, all right. Um, this will be our last person, uh, Ms. Presley. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First of all, for your partnership with my office in scheduling this hearing. In my uh, eight-year tenure on the Boston City Council, I convened seven hearings on trauma because it takes uh, many uh, iterations and manifestations and because it is all interconnected. Violence begets violence and trauma begets trauma. And so many families and communities like my own are passing along, uh, unfortunately, the legacy of intergenerational trauma. I thank each of you for being here. In order for us to work on it, we have to first speak on it. But one of the things that I think stands in the way of our speaking on it is the stigma and the shame that survivors carry when it is not your shame to carry. As hard as it is for people to conceive of the fact that someone they love could be traumatized or violated in such an egregious way, it's harder for us to accept that there are people in our own family, in our community, and in society that we know that could perpetrate such vile acts. I was just wondering if you could speak to, and first of all, I also just want to say, it's so important, I'm sorry you have to weaponize your pain in order for this survivor tribe to be seen and to be heard, but it's so critical that this work be survivor-led. But could you just speak to the stigma aspect and how that is a barrier uh, to addressing what is a public health, a pervasive public health issue in our country? Ms. Rigg. Uh, you know, I I really believe that the stigma around not talking about trauma within your families and and with my family, it was um, you just kind of moved on. Um, the women in my family, going back to my grandmother, they 
didn't work, they didn't support themselves, and so it was kind of just something that you dealt with, and that's kind of what carried through my family, and the importance of just being open with it and having open conversations. Um, that's what I'm trying to do with my children, and uh, to share my story with other survivors and with young parents with what I'm doing with National Curtain and within the YPAC is to help other parents understand that Aside from being a young parent, if you have that trauma in your life, that's also something that you need to address in your life and, and share with your children so that they know and are aware um, if they do see it and recognize it. And I think the importance of making sure that we have those resources and that we can heal ourselves first so that we can help heal the next generation is extremely important. Um, so uh, with National Curtainton, that's the one thing that we, uh, that I really pride myself that we're working in in that group is just making sure that we're there to support each other through that healing first so that we can help others and help our children heal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, um, we will now, we're going to change panels, but let me say this before you go. Uh, I agree with my distinguished colleague from Virginia, um, Mr. Connolly. This has been some of the um, most chilling testimony that I've heard in my 23 years in Congress. Um, but I want to leave you with a message. You know, when bad things happen to us, we should not ask the question, why did it happen to us? But we should ask the question, why did it happen for us? I know that's a tough one. I know it's tough. But you know, when I think about you, Mr. Miller, and what you are doing today, and the idea, Mr. Miller, there's somebody, and all of you, there's somebody watching you right now on C-SPAN whose life is going to be saved. And I know that, you know, you may say, I paid a high price for this to save somebody's life. But I guarantee you, there's somebody, and Mr. Killebrew, there's a little boy who has experienced the same thing in Baltimore, where we live, who's saying, you know what? I think I can get through this. I think I can. And so, and to, to you, Ms. Martin, to Ms. Ray, the idea that you would come in and lay some of the most personal things in your life on the table so that the world can understand it. And so sometimes I think that when, you, when you're going through all of this, remember my words. I love these words. Pain, passion, purpose. You've gone through a pain, and many of you are still going through pain. It leads you to your passion to do your purpose. A lot of the people that are sitting behind you, I noticed you got family members here. They have gone through this pain with you, right? Am I right? They have been supportive. And you know what, guess what? They have learned to be even more compassionate. You got me? So I want you to know that you are, I know it's hard to, I know it's hard to, 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 for this to get through, but you are gifts they keep on giving. And we need you to continue your advocacy. And Mr. Miller, you said something that uh, I, 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 I just can't let this go by because I feel like I committed malpractice if it didn't. Um, you said there came a point in your life where you wanted, who needs to hear my story? Or, you know, do I want to really share this story? Yeah. You need to share, all of you need to share your story. Maybe you need to write a book. I'm, I'm serious. So that somebody can see what you went through and how you got to where you got to. And finally, let me leave you with this. There's nobody who has lived the life that you have lived. You have lived it. A lot of people come and talk about, you know, they write theses and all this kind of stuff. No, nah, you have lived it. But more importantly, you're willing to share it. And more important than that, you are willing to make somebody's life better. And we all, we all appreciate you. All right? Did you have something else to say? All right, thank you very much. We're going to now move on to the next panel.
Thank you, Pastor. We're going to go out to our members. We're going to start back in three minutes. Three minutes. One minute. and Bethel are in the bathroom. So. As soon as they get, I need to know as soon as they get in the door. Yeah. Um, you want me to wait to see if you can take a pool later for you? Hmm? You want me to wait to see if you can take a pool? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, later. What, what time? I'll let you know. Uh, I'm gonna, no, so I can let you know. Probably in about, uh, about a half an hour or so. We are waiting for two witnesses. While we're waiting, I want to thank uh, the uh, committee for uh, adhering to our uh, time limitations on the first panel. It was very helpful. Now, do we have everybody? Hasanola, do we have everybody? All right. All right. Kelly? Okay, I won't work that out. Don't worry about it. No, no. Sorry. No, Mr. Gasolni, I'd like to. Just wait a minute. No, wait, hold on. Oh. Let me get started. Yeah. Right. Our second panel is comprised of federal, state, and local officials and medical experts who will discuss the prevalence and you, 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 may, you can sit down for the time being. Um, discuss the prevalence and the consequences of childhood trauma and the steps that we urgently need to take to address this epi epidemic. <clears throat> I would like to thank all of our witnesses, but I especially want to thank Dr. Horry uh, from the CDC. I know that there is a, a general preference for agency witnesses to sit on their own panel, so I really appreciate you working with us uh, to make this happen. I hope uh, this hearing will be a, continuing, a continuance to be informative, collaborative, and productive. We're honored to have all of these extraordinary uh, individuals before us today on both panels. Okay. Dr. Dr. Deborah Horay, Director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, will be our first witness. Dr. Christina D. Bethel, Director of Child and Adolescent Bethel. Health Measurement Initiative, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is located in my district. 
Dr. Denise Shervington, clinical professor of psychiatry, Tulane University School of Medicine, Dr. James Henry, former deputy governor and chief of staff, state of Tennessee, and Mr. Charles Patterson, health commissioner, Clark County, Ohio. Now, if you would all please rise and raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and you may be seated. Uh, I remind you, I guess most of you were in the room earlier, but the microphones are very sensitive. Uh, your statements will be limited to five minutes. Please know that we already have your written statements, um, but we are basically looking for a summary of your most significant points. Uh, and I beg you to stay within that five minutes. You have the, the, the lighting system, as I explained a little bit earlier. Uh, and now uh, we will hear from Dr. Hore. Good morning, Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. Thank you for bringing attention to the important problem of childhood trauma. And thank you to the brave survivors who just shared their stories with us. I'm Dr. Deb Howery, and as an emergency physician, I was honored to join CDC in 2014 as the director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. In the ER, I've seen firsthand the impact the trauma has on children. I still remember the toddler I saw for fever and cough. When I looked at his chest x-ray and diagnosed pneumonia, I almost missed the multiple rib x-ray, multiple fractures he had on his rib x-ray. It became clear he had suffered trauma over a long period of time. I did my best to console him and contacted Child Protective Services to assess his home environment and safety. And cases like this kept me up at night, and I wished I could have prevented this and other childhood traumas. Now I know by focusing on prevention and building the resilience of our communities, we can meet the immediate needs of those already affected, reduce the long-term effects of trauma, and prevent trauma. Major sources of childhood trauma are called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Examples are child abuse and neglect, or witnessing violence, mental illness, or substance misuse in the home. As the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for long-term negative effects on learning, behavior, and health. CDC research shows that more than 60% of American adults have experienced at least one ACE, and almost a quarter of adults have experienced three or more. ACEs have been linked to the leading causes of death, including suicide and drug overdoses, shortening a person's lifespan by almost 20 years. The total economic cost of ACEs is conservatively estimated in the hundreds of billions of dollars each year. There is a need for action to prevent ACEs and their health and social consequences. As the nation's public health agency, CDC is positioned to lead coordinated efforts to prevent ACEs. This starts with using data to understand the scope and burden. Our state-based behavioral risk factor surveillance system is a key source of data. Recent analysis of these data found some groups are at higher risk of experiencing ACEs and should be prioritized for prevention and response efforts. In addition to collecting data, we work with health departments to prevent ACEs in their communities. For example, we released several resources that include evidence-based strategies communities can use, such as encouraging and developing positive parenting skills and providing quality care and education early in life. We also fund an Essentials for Childhood program where states can use community-level strategies to prevent child abuse and neglect, a major contributor to ACEs. In Washington, a coalition of schools, city government, social services, and law enforcement launched an initiative to raise awareness of ACEs and brain development and to foster resilience. This led to the community adopting trauma-informed practices in schools, increasing community awareness of ACEs by fivefold, and reducing expulsions in a high school by 85% in a year. CDC also works with the Office of National Drug Control Policy to fund public health, public safety interventions at the local level. One example, the Martinsburg Initiative in West Virginia, is an innovative police-school community partnership 
focused on identifying children with high ACE scores and linking them to necessary resources and supports to prevent future opioid misuse. To date, nearly 400 school staff have been trained in ACEs recognition and trauma-informed responses. Understanding ACEs is essential as we collectively pursue strategies to address two of the most pressing public health threats facing our nation, overdose and suicide. The connection between ACEs, substance use, and suicide can lead to a continuous cycle for generations. By preventing ACEs through coordinated, comprehensive strategies, we can avoid exposure in future generations. CDC and public health bring a unique and important perspective to ACEs prevention and can help communities implement strategies that promote safe, stable, and supportive environments for children and families. CDC is committed to working with Congress, other federal, state, and local agencies, and partners to address these complex issues and ultimately to save lives. Thank you. Ms. Bethel, Dr. Bethel. Your mic is not on. We really want to hear you. I got it. Okay. Um, good morning, Chairperson Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan and members of the committee. And thank you for inviting me here to speak with you today and for your leadership on this important issue. Um, as you know, my name is Christina Bethel. I'm a professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University and also a board member of the nonprofit uh, and nonpartisan Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. I am also a person with lived experience of the majority of childhood traumas that are measured in the ACEs study and a grateful recipient of nearly every federal program supporting vulnerable children and families. The science of ACEs and resilience shine a light on the importance of the moment-by-moment -moment relational experiences of children to their healthy brain, body, and social-emotional development, not only of our children but our entire population. The science requires a paradigm shift in how we think about child development, human health, social problems, and the skills and requirements for our own well-being, which we can learn. Like an eddy in a river that stops the flow of water, we now have biological, through biological research, understand that trauma also stalls healthy brain, body, and social emotional development of children. And these impacts cut across life and across generations. We then go on to diagnose, medicate, treat, and the illnesses that are often very predictable outpicturings of unhealed trauma without any awareness of their origins, the biologic drivers of this, or the possibilities for healing. When enough people, such as the two-thirds of adults in the country, and nearly, and nearly half of US children are exposed to ACEs, we have what we call a synergistic epidemic, where we can't deal with what ails us unless we also deal with the long reach of trauma and proactively promote relational health, emotional and stress regulation skills, and all of the factors essential to health and well-being. Addressing childhood trauma and promoting well-being is our greatest public health challenge, and in this work, we are the medicine that we need. We must foster through any door cross-sector strategies to build engaged, healthy communities that work together, shift social norms to support healthy parenting, eliminate stigma and shame, and build a trauma-informed workforce. And in this, we need a stronger and more robust federal policy response. We're fortunate today that many people understand these issues, but most do not. It is still new. Just last month, in a room of 600 early education, healthcare, and uh, social service workers, only 30 raised their hand that they had ever heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And upon learning it, they realized the lack of coordination among them all of whom served the same families, were re-traumatizing the families and also by not engaging the families and ignoring the issues that they knew once they learned about it were really the underbelly of the problems the families faced. So while ACEs connection and change in mind and many of our other systems um, engage hundreds of communities, most communities are not engaged and need much more support for data, measurement, training, personnel, and research. So my written testimony includes much more data and recommendations related to the committee's area of jurisdiction in each of the areas. But before I close, 
I do wish to mention just a few more recommendations related to our growing evidence base. First, we need a population-wide approach. This is all of us. We need an era of experimentation and investment to build personnel and shift our workforce. Uh, we need quality well child care services and early um, care and education as our top opportunities to prevent and mitigate ACEs. And we need to invest in building a national caring capacity that is trauma-informed. We also need immediate shifts in federal supported programs and services that can perpetuate trauma unwittingly. Family-centered coordinated services across healthcare, legal, education, and social service systems are needed but are often blocked by federal policies or lack of leadership. We also need access to high quality, what we call neuro repair and other methods that can reestablish disrupted neural connections and rebuild the often lost capabilities and skills for something as simple as recognizing your own body and emotional experiences, reframe disruptive thinking that can perpetuate trauma and recognize impacts of your, of, on self and others. So to close, the distinct fields of science are coming together to create an integrated science of thriving, and we need to use the knowledge and tools we have, evolve them, and conduct rapid cycle research to drive innovation and implementation, shift how we train, incentivize, and pay for programs impacting our population's health and well-being. I feel very fortunate to live in a time when our science lived experience and now our policies will meet to catalyze an epidemic of well-being that will place the U.S. in the top rather than the bottom few of developing countries in child well-being. Grateful to be part of your leadership toward creating a well-being nation, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Sherrington. Chairman Elijah Cummins, ranking member Jim Jordan, and other distinguished members, I am deeply humbled and honored to testify before such an esteemed group of leaders who've come together as concerned Americans to address this troubling and ever-growing epidemic of childhood trauma. I also would like to pay my respect for those who came before us, being so willing to share their pain. I applaud your efforts and hope that I can add a little bit of science and maybe much more about my on-the-ground experience to assist in the decisions that I know that you will make. My colleagues before have talked a lot about the ACEs, so I'm going to skip that. But what I would just like, there's a metaphor that keeps coming up for me that um, pediatrician and psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott used to describe children who were suffering, unfortunately, from the trauma of their parents. And he called it that they were suffering primitive agony. And unfortunately, we sometimes have children in communities or in the societies in which they belong where they're not the protective factors and resilience building conditions for them to heal and ultimately thrive and reach their potential. I have lived and worked through the impact of the natural disaster Katrina that decimated New Orleans in 2005. And unfortunately, some of those effects are still being felt by certain communities. And now, today, we're under threat of another flood, and I know that the people in New Orleans are re-traumatized and are triggered. The lessons that we've learned from Katrina are very applicable to disasters in other places. California, the earthquakes, the fires in the west, the tornadoes, the blizzards and the snows in the Atlantic and Northeast, and any other extreme weather event. Because unfortunately for children, it shatters their view that the world is safe. And oftentimes, it shatters the view that the adults can protect them, because oftentimes the adults themselves become dysregulated. And when you add that to children who are living in spaces with chronic adversities, where they have to deal with the impact of violence on a daily basis, or being bullied excessively, or being in foster care systems, as was added to the conventional ACEs, we know that this becomes even more difficult for them. The impact 
of exposure to a natural or technological disaster as happened in the Gulf can be profound when that's added for communities that are underserved and living with community trauma. There is evidence now, as was earlier said, that there are these very potentially disabling, negative proximal and distal physical and mental health outcomes of childhood trauma and that it costs so much. Um, so what I, as my distinguished colleagues before me have said, the Centers for Disease Control, the academics, centers who are studying this, the professional organizations like the ones I belong to, the American Psychiatric Association, we have a role to play with those who have the lived experiences of trauma and the community members who need to understand that trauma is not normal. In many of our communities, and I have a case of a young man who, after he witnessed someone being killed in front of him, his mother told him, it's okay, baby, you'll get over it, don't worry. And so he didn't know that he was gonna get worried and ended up with a life in prison, doing all the things because of his dysregulation. But lucky for him, he found another pathway and is now a teacher. And so I think about him and I think about the need for us to inform our communities that trauma is not normal, we can't keep it moving, and that we need then to think about the services that we will need when our children have these experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's certainly an honor for me to be here today, too. And to is your mic on? One Certainly day. an honor for me to be here today, and I look forward to, to my testimony. In January of 2015, I got a call from the First Lady, and she said, I want you to go to a meeting in Memphis. They're talking about ACEs. And I was the commissioner of the Department of Children's Services that I think in most terms would have been called a disaster when I went there. And four years later, we end up winning a child help award and appearing before this Congress. So we made some progress, and we're still making progress. But I went to that meeting, and one of the things you have to do as a community before you can get anything done is have the right people at the meeting. Well, when I got there, everybody that was anything in Memphis was at that meeting. And I wasn't looking forward to the meeting. I didn't think it was going anywhere. I've been to a 1,000 of them, if you know what I mean, and none of them mean anything. But at that meeting, I heard a presentation by Robert Andrew about ACEs. And it was so clear to me, even clear to me, a guy born in East Tennessee, seventh generation East Tennessean, born between the mountains, born in a little town. My mother and dad were married for 65 years. I never experienced any trauma other than my grandmother getting mad at me a couple of times. They helped raise me. My aunt drove you know, me back and forth to school. My other aunt taught school. My uncle ran the drugstore. There was 50 relatives that helped raise me within 25 miles of Madisonville, Tennessee. And if you don't think that makes a difference, it does. And it, I realized for the first time that, well, maybe you just didn't pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You had some help. And so as I came back, you know, I began to think about it. And then when I got promoted to uh, quickly after that, I got promoted to chief of staff and, and took over that. I gave our chief, our cabinet, an ACEs test. Well, guess how many people had ACEs that were over two? Two out of 22 cabinet members. Well, how do I get across the problems that inner city Memphis or Appalachia has with drugs and poverty, how did I get that across to people that have never experienced it? And it's not an easy, it's not an easy task, but you can. But we, the first thing we did is you have to have the governor involved and they have to have some dollars. We got the legislature to approve dollars. We made it recurring dollars. We got into everybody. We went to see the newspapers. We did editorial boards just like you'd do in a campaign. 
and we got them to hold a summit not long after that that brought together everybody in Tennessee that was something. The congressional offices were recognized and they came and, and we wanted them to see what would really make a difference in the $5 billion deficit in economic development that ACES was costing Tennessee. $5 billion because we don't have trained people that have trauma. And most of the health care comes from, you know, smoking and, and uh, drug use. And, and, you know, it was amazing to me to see how much similarities there were between Memphis and Appalachia. And I mean, drugs, poverty, uh, not moving forward. It was almost the same. And of course, you know, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where we uh, are lucky to have the highest concentration of doctorate degrees in the world right across the mountain is where we've got the most abject poverty in Appalachia. It's even worse than the inner cities. So we set out to make a difference. We got the appropriations, we got people involved. We adopted, but we need Congress now to help us move forward with this. We've got it on such a stage, 42,000 people in Tennessee have been trained on this. 6,000, over 6,000 teachers. And you know, we've got 2,000 Baptist churches in Tennessee, and if all of them would take responsibility for one child, we could really make a difference. We're making a difference in Tennessee. We're gonna make uh, the next generation much better. But Congress, we need your help. We need your help. Thank you very much, Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk about this topic because this is one of those things in public health that we call a root cause. We're trying to figure out why we've had an incredible opioid ep epidemic in Ohio and in Clark County. Um, we're trying to figure out you know, why we can't fill the jobs that we have. We have good paying jobs in our community now. We can't fill them. And why can we not fill them? It goes back to the ACEs. It goes back to the childhood trauma that we have not treated properly. We have not informed our community. And we're just figuring that out in Clark County, Ohio. We're figuring out that this multi-generational poverty that we have is actually multi-generational trauma driven. Because there, there's a way to get out of poverty. There are good jobs. There, there, you know, we're not talking minimum wage jobs. We're talking about $20 an hour jobs and you don't have to have a college degree. But we can't put people in them because they don't have driver's licenses from the drug use and they can't pass the drug test. We've got teachers in schools that are trying to teach and they're trying to go towards STEM and doing that work, but they can't teach the top kids, they can't teach the middle kids. They're spending their time dealing with the childhood tra trauma. They're dealing with the child that's coming to school with all that trauma who's disrupting the classroom. And we've always thought that it was because Johnny was a bad kid. And now we've figured out it's because Johnny's lived with stuff that most of us can't even imagine. We're seeing it in our court system. Our court system is full, and our court system is full of folks with mental health problems and with opioid problems. We, we review drug deaths for the last several years, since 2015 in our community, because we're trying to figure out why. We're trying to do that, once again, a root cause analysis. But when you review a mother's death, and then later on, you review the death of the son, and you wonder, could it have been ACEs? Could it have been the trauma that the child lived with this, the mom going through drug abuse for many years, and then sitting at the kitchen table doing, doing opioids together? It's very sad when we're looking at, and we've got the data that shows us that we're seeing generation after generation. So what are we doing locally? Um, we actually have a steering committee on trauma. It, it met yesterday, and it has a strategic plan. 
But that plan is basically what the, what the CDC said earlier, let's make everyone provide trauma-informed care. So not everybody is going to see a doctor, not everybody is going to see a clinician. We need everyone in the community to be able to begin to build the relationships because the relationships are key and that's, what, that's where the healing can begin. We haven't talked about it enough. And so our community, you're right. When you said, you know, only, only a handful out of 600 people knew about trauma-informed care, uh, we're seeing that in our community as well. And so we need to get that message out that anybody in this room can provide trauma-informed care. You don't have to be a medical doctor or, or a clinician or a psychiatrist. Uh, you can begin just by building that friendship. What, what do we need the federal government to do? Uh, what you're doing now is talk about it and come up with a comprehensive approach. What we, what we don't need is the part of education say we need to do this and then law enforcement's gonna do this and the medical community is gonna do something else. We need it to be a coordinated effort so that they're all playing from the same handbook. We need workforce development because right now we have open positions for clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists in our community, and we can't fill them because those people just don't exist. We don't have enough of them. And the other thing is continue to talk about trauma-informed care because what we, what we can ask you to do is provide hope. There is hope. The brain can heal itself. And we really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh... I really appreciate your testimony. I'm going to um, yield myself a few minutes to ask questions, and I just want to let you know that I'm going to step out for about a half an hour, and then I'm coming back, um, maybe a little bit longer, but, but I've got something that i got to do. I really miss out on a second of our hearings. It's hard. Sometimes it's six, seven hours, but I'm here. Um, so I don't want you to see that as in any way disrespectful. Now, um, Mr. Henry, I, I keep, for some reason, I keep going back to a question that uh, Congresswoman Presley asked a little bit earlier of the other panel. And she talked about stigma. And when I heard you say that you all were able to gather everybody in a room the, the people who make a difference, I assume the people can make decisions, um, and I guess you're talking about the business community too, I guess. How did they do that? Because you, 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 you uh, uh, Mr. Heitz and I were just talking about how you all have apparently been able to do something to get past this um, thing of, oh, it's their fault or when you see the uh, child in need, here they go again, that, you know, that kind of thing. How do you get past that? And living in the inner city of Baltimore myself, going back to something you said, Mr. Patterson, I look at some of the children and I wonder how they even, even get to adulthood. I mean, with all the forces going against them. So I'm, I'm just, how did you do that, Mr. Henry? Well, I think number one is they have to be aware of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, there are so many people. There, there are a lot of kids involved here and a lot of impact from this. But not many people really recognize it. It's a lot like dealing with people with disabilities. You know, for a long time in this country, we didn't realize exactly what we were dealing with. You know, we did just the opposite of what you ought to do with those kind of things. I mean, we hid people with disabilities. We, we segregated them, we did all those things. I had a son with disabilities, he, he passed away but, and had terrific disabilities, but the best thing for him was when he got out with people and they treated him normal. And you've gotta have mentors, you've gotta have these, these uh, organizations that are willing to step up and you've got to have somebody at the head mm -hmm. of it that can draw that kind of crowd. The governor of our state took the lead. Mm -hmm. And his wife took the lead. 
it's about leadership. And there is no, you know, no substitute for that. And in Memphis, it was A.C. Wharton. And, you know, A.C. took the lead. And the uh, Pyramid Foundation. And, you know, we brought all those people together. And some of my best friends in the legislature, I've served as Republican leader for, for a number of years under Governor Alexander, Senator Alexander. And, uh, and the way we did things was that we worked together. I mean, there are very few partisan issues. When you look at kids, education, these kind of things, I mean, it's bigger than partisan. Yeah, yeah. So we agreed on those things, and, and we used part of that coalition, and we still do today, I mean, to, to bring people together and, and tackle these terrible problems. I mean, Tennessee's got huge problems. They're one of the biggest perpetrators of drugs, you know, alcohol smoking causes 42% of our total health problems. Wow. Smoking. And, you know, and, and because we've got a history of raising it and being it, and it was the manly thing to do when my dad grew up was to smoke. But he had a heart attack when he was 56 years old, you know, and, yeah. and, and didn't. He, and he He survived for another 20 years, and then he got poisoned working up at Oak Ridge, and thank goodness that... The Congress appropriated the money in the 80s to uh, take care of some of those folks that died of, uh, of exposure to radiation. But those, it's, it's got to be an all-out effort. It can't be four or five people in a state. I just have one other question, and that is to you, uh, Dr. Bethel. Um, piggybacking on what Mr. Henry just talked about, you said that so often uh, folks are doing things that actually are hurting the kids instead of helping them. Can you elaborate on that? And he, he said, I want, to, I want to see it from her right now, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I did you, you did say that, and make sure your mic is on, go ahead. I did, and I can give you a very concrete example yeah, from that, that same, same meeting that I was at a month ago where most people didn't know about ACEs when they learned a Title V special health needs specialist that was going into the home to treat a child with autism and noticed that the mother was under extreme distress and also that the child was not able to focus by continuing to look at the mother and cry. And he wouldn't have gotten paid and he would have been reprimanded if he hadn't executed those exercises for autism treatment and did, had no way of addressing the issue because it was not in his purview, nor did he have any information about the other home care visitors and others that were treating the same family, and neither did the mother know all of the services that she was receiving. There was no way for them to work together, coordinate, and deal with this cross-cutting issue. Probably the traumatization to that child by being forced to do exercises that were not really what the issue was uh, made him feel like he had actually hurt those children and when we talked about this in a later breakout, it went on for a good while what we could do. You know, my mother, used to example. Say, my mother used to say, there's nothing like a person who don't know what they don't know. That's right. And she only had a fourth grade education. Yeah. But this person knew and couldn't do anything. Mm. Even. And so you got almost the, lead, the blind. That's right. Leading the blind. They're not only leading them, they're leading them in the wrong direction. Right. Yes, sir, Mr. Henry. Yes, yes sir. One final thing, now I'll quit preaching to you, Mr. Chairman, but, uh, you know, kids are not inadvertently mean. That's a learned behavior. And, I mean, if you raise them in the wrong environment, they're going to turn out unsuccessful most of the time. And we see a lot of times where somebody somehow pulls himself up, and then you say, well, you can do it if you'd pull yourself up. Well, that's not reality. If you're raised in a bad environment, you're probably not going to turn out too good. Wow. If killing and drugs is the norm, that's what you're going to, you know, head toward. If yeah. not working is the norm, that's what you're going to do. My, my last question is, um, what, some of you have talked about this briefly, but what would you like to see us in the federal government do to help children? I mean, us in Congress. Dr. Shervington, would you have something? Yes, I, government can really assist the coordination of these services. Like the gentleman said, we don't need the Department of Ed on one side, law enforcement on one side. I think we have 
our public health agency, the Centers for Disease Control. We have the more clinically oriented services in HHS, SAMHSA. I think that if those efforts were better coordinated, and I'm looking to the population level approach to even bring SAMHSA in, I think that it would be really helpful to communities when we have one message, almost one kind of science about how we're going to go ahead and heal. Thank you. Mr. Patterson. Having the hearing today, that's the start, right? Yeah. Talking about it and letting people know that it's out there, understanding that it is a root cause, and then continuing to provide evidence-based programming that folks like the CDC present to us so that we can implement it on the ground at the local level. We don't have the resources at the local level to try something that might work. In most cases, we need to put our local resources into an evidence-based practice that if we do it to fidelity, we're going to get a result. And so you can, you can direct your research funding at programming that provides that local evidence-based practice. Dr. Horry? I think it's important not to lose sight of prevention, really primary prevention. All too often in the ER, I'd see it, we'd see that trauma, and I'd focus on how do I save that life? How did I prevent that injury from coming in the first place is key. And there's so many ways that can be done through early childhood education, promoting social norms, parenting skills, um, really connecting youth to caring adults, and we have evidence-based programs that do this. We need better evaluation of them. I think, as Mr. Patterson was saying, looking at some of the local innovations, being able to evaluate them and scale them up, and CDC is ready and poised to really work with Congress on this. Ms. Henry. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say I think the best thing you could do is, is bring is, is what you're doing today. And, and you know, I think states need to make a commitment. Federal government doesn't just need to do this. If you can't get a commitment from the state to, to understand they've got a problem out there, you're just gonna be wasting your money. But I mean, these there ought to be some barometer of how a state, and how they appeal. I mean, whether a, a, a legislature understands this issue, are they willing to appropriate recurring money? Right. Not okay. one time, Right. Sustained. but recurring money. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Bethel. Yeah, first of all, there's a way to, we need to leverage existing programs and policies that are not fully implemented or brought to scale, including EPST, CAPTA, and many of the other programs that serve children already that do not integrate this information or are paying and training in ways that support their implementation. We also, I think, need the federal government to take the, the lead in creating a through any door awareness by being the leader, like in Tennessee, and being relentless in that. And then also, all of the, all of the NIH programs that study any disease practically know that this is a factor, but it is not included in RFPs as a requirement for measurement. We have a lot of things that are, and we can start to learn more by integrating information about ACEs as well as protective factors, positive health, and engagement of communities and people, which is essential. And finally, to really help the communities that are out there that need an emergent process, even though there's evidence base, the truth is, is that this has to be tailored to the real people in a real community owned by them. And so we need common element approaches and supports to implement them with data, measurement, tools, and models that then can be used by communities where they adapt and make it their own. Because unless we make it our own, nothing will change. This is relational and engagement-based. Thank you very much. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, my goodness. You all have made my brain go all over the place. I certified to teach a long, long time ago, but just due to various life experiences, I didn't teach, but I volunteered in the school system anywhere between 10 and 17 years in some fashion. And the things that you've talked about, um, I remember one little boy that I'd been with on and off for years who played ball with my son, and he had terrible life experiences. And he'd been shot, and he, I mean, just many things. He'd made really bad choices. And I can remember one day being in the mall, and he was hanging out with a group of people you wouldn't want him to hang out with. And he saw me, and he walked away from that group and came up and hugged me and just put his head on my shoulder because he knew I loved him and he knew I believed in him. And 
I've been involved with the three branch initiatives that they've tried. There's so many programs out there that you all have touched or been involved with while we're all trying to reach those children. We, we have alternative schools in West Virginia that if you talk to the kids, nearly all of them have seen someone in their family doing drugs, just like you said. But now I'll go back to what I was really gonna talk about. In our committees, in previous discussions, we've had many, many discussions about the opioid epidemic. And I have talked about my home state of West Virginia multiple times because it is ground zero for this epidemic, as you know. We are now seeing second and third generation effects from this epidemic. Children that are being neonatally exposed to drugs, they're in the school system. The principals and the teachers are trying to find the correct way to deal with their behavior. So listening to the things you have to say, it's just so important. Many children are being raised by other family members, grandparents, even great grandparents, because grandma's on drugs, you just, it's just, it's happening. We have now seen how the, the environment increases their proclivity for behavioral problems and attraction to drugs themselves. Mr. Henry and Mr. Patterson, you could be my next door neighbor. You know, just the, the experiences you've had, the, what you're doing, the way you talk. I mean, we, we are in West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky. We all touch Tennessee. We're all cousins. You know, we all touch the same problems. And so hearing what you've done in Tennessee sounds wonderful. And I relate to what you're trying to do in Ohio because we, we've been fighting this in Huntington, West Virginia a long time. Dr. Hurry, you've been home. You've been where I am. Can you discuss how the rise in the opioid epidemic has led to an increase in trauma with children? Absolutely, and I think Huntington has really, although it's been the epicenter, I think it's really up and coming when you look at all of yes. the great activities yes. that are going there. I, I left there so impressed and inspired by the work that was being done there. There was Lily's Place to where yes. you saw newborns that were in an appropriate, comforting environment, and parents were taught, how do you parent? You know, How do you really nurture those stable, nurturing relationships, which are the fundamentals to protect against child maltreatment and to protect against childhood trauma. So I think that's one of the most significant things you can do. When you just look at ACEs in general, if you have six or more ACEs, it's been shown that men are 46 times more likely to inject drugs with that much exposure to trauma. And so one of the things that I always say that keeps me up at night is we have good treatment for opioids. We don't have good treatment for meth and cocaine and these other drug epidemics that are coming. So if we don't focus on childhood trauma and the exposure to substances in the home, we're going to be in a whole lot of trouble 20 years from now, 10 years from now. And so we have to focus on, again, primary prevention of these childhood traumas linked with opioid misuse. And we are seeing more kids entering foster care as a result of exposure to opioids. So I think, again, looking at protective factors, like looking at how do you have youth linked to caring adults, whether it's a big brother, big sister program, after school matters, the programs in Martinsburg, I think all those things we can do to put in protective supports for kids who are exposed to opioids will really help buffer those effects. Well, what evidence is available to show the role of the faith-based and the family-based that can help these victims? So what, what I would say is it's about that safe, stable, nurturing re relationship, and it's any caring adult. And so uh, there's a program called Powerful Voices really focused on women and girls to give them that leadership and that um, courage and that resiliency. Faith-based communities are an important partner. I'd say police are an important partner. Education's an important partner. Honestly, we need all sectors to be partners at the table, and I defer to my colleagues to really add to that. May I have some more time, please? If you could, uh, anyone who wants to address <coughs> that specific issue? I just want to say one thing that many might not know about, but in the mid-1950s, the Harvard Mastery of Stress Study asked uh, college students what they, how to rate, rate their parental caring and warmth. And they did a 35-year follow-up study that was published the year before the ACES study was published, showing that those that had low ratings 
had 80, 87% had illnesses and diseases, many of which was addiction. And when um, they rated it high, it was 28%. And so what we know is it's the absence of the positive, which we can nurture, that really is the buffering and the support that we need. So even with ACEs, when we have positive childhood experiences and warmth and nurturing, so any program that can facilitate that, we can expect it to reduce addiction, which many top NIH NIDA researchers now call repetitive compulsive self-soothing, mm. which will occur. The nervous system will win, and we need to learn, help people understand that they're not, they're not bad. They're trying to soothe their nervous system, and there are other healthy ways to do it. One of the uh, things that I've observed in our hospitals who are dealing with these precious babies is there's, there are cuddling programs where people come in and rock the babies. And I made the point to the particular people in the hospital, it is as important for men to come and rock these babies as it is for women because the babies need the feeling of that man holding them close just as much as they do the female. It, it's so important that our children feel that warmth and that um, just that love that you get from sitting and rocking a baby, particularly those that are um, drug exposed, um, that cry incessantly because they, you know, things aren't firing exactly right and they don't know what's wrong. But um, to me, the programs that, that you all are coming together with and the communities that come together, it, it takes us all to do this. And I'm, I could ask you about the Support Act and the opioid epidemics and, you know, are there other ways that our administration can help address trauma? So if, do you all have any suggestions of additional things? Do you, do you think ACEs are, is the answer? Are there more things that we should work on? And I would encourage you to answer that, Ms. Miller. I appreciate your um, interest and your passion. If we get a chance, we can come back for more time if you're here. But if you could just concisely maybe respond to the Congresswoman's comments and questions. I think there's many things you could do. Uh, you know, you can visit those, those places. You can make that a topic when you visit. You can bring the argument home. You can have hearings on it. Um, you know, not necessarily everything comes from money, but it helps. But I mean, don't send any money to a place that's not committed to solve this problem. And being committed, it means that everybody's in. I mean, the whole future, whatever we're dealing with around this world is not as important as this. I can tell you the future of America depends on how our children are raised. And if we don't make a difference in them, then we're going to lose all the battles. So, I mean, it, you know, you draw a lot of attention when you go somewhere. I appreciate and if that. You were, <laughs> if you were well-versed and, 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 you know, just had the training and, and, and related it to our churches across this state, I mean, across this country, about, you know, this is what you can do. Tennessee has 2,000 children in custody, 2,000 churches in Tennessee. Why don't you take one child? I mean, if more than just Baptist churches, but I mean, there are places everywhere, and we're doing a lot of that, but there needs to be a bigger attention to it, and there's no bigger chess, I mean, no bigger chess game going on between special interest and this, because, you know, you're talking about drugs, and the use of drugs and the, you know, the good people and the bad people. It's like the old time um, preachers and the whiskey dealers getting together and being sure that there weren't any license put out. But you know, we need to be sure that we've got all these people on the same side. I tell you, if you are out there in the community, there is nothing more important than this. And I mean, I, will, I would love to have all the funding you could give but that commitment is what we need more than anything. Thank you, Mr. Henry. We're going to recognize Ms. Washerman Schultz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Bethel, um, I want to direct my questioning to you, but I have a sort of a, a preamble before I ask you the question. You mentioned in your opening statement that we need a paradigm shifting evolution to address childhood trauma. And I've been thinking about childhood trauma a lot this week. Um, about the kids at the border being traumatized by dehumanizing treatment in detention facilities, 
about the women who experienced sexual abuse as children at the hands of Jeffrey Epstein and then had their rights violated by our Secretary of Labor, Alex Acosta, denying them any justice or accountability. About the kids in Parkland, in my home county and around the country whose lives have been altered dramatically by senseless acts of gun violence. And in addition to everything else, the outrage that these are flagrant public health issues. That these are young people in our country that we are categorically failing. And I appreciate so much the courage of Ms. Rigg from the first panel when she testified that she felt she, quote, slipped through all of the cracks in the agencies that are designed to protect children from trauma. Those cracks feel like chasms. I, I want to ask about one of the systems that failed Ms. Rigg. Approximately 90% of children in the juvenile justice system have at least two adverse childhood experiences. And, you know, why do we sanitize all of these terms? You know, adverse childhood experiences are, are is, a, is a lot, you know, blunter, more rounding the corners way to, to call the trauma that she described what it is. I won't repeat the, uh, the, the words, but uh, it's hard to, to feel the same impact that her test, like her testimony gave us with the term ACE. ACE is benign. Um, nearly half of the girls in the system have five or more ACEs. Under the Trump administration, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Reform rescinded guidance about trauma-informed reforms for girls in the juvenile justice system. And OJJDP Administrator Karen Harp said the agency is too focused on therapeutic interventions and has questioned the validity of neuroscience regarding adolescent brain development science. So Dr. Bethel, why are trauma-informed approaches to discipline important? And I'll ask Dr. Shervington um, as well. Your organization's Sad Not Bad campaign focused on shifting public understanding of the behavior of young people who've experienced complex trauma. And if you could describe why that's important as well. OK, I'll say just a couple things, um, and then we can elaborate on it if you'd like. But um, we do things to try to help children who we think need our help. But if they're not able to be present and, and, in, and in their own body, let's say, able to take in information even, they're not able to learn or do anything. And so what happens under ACEs is we get something that may be called developmental trauma disorder. And trauma is as trauma does. Even if people who don't have ACEs, they can have trauma. And this leads to dysregulation of emotions and body systems around stress of any kind where small stresses start to feel very big when you've had a history of trauma. So even a small request can be difficult to manage and you can start to feel the panic and the trauma in your system without even knowing that you're, you're not even having any thoughts. It's can happening. I just ask you briefly, do, yeah. you think, do you agree with Administrator Karen Harp that said, when she says the agency is too focused on therapeutic interventions? And is there any doubt over the validity of neuroscience Effect. There is no I'm, doubt over the validity of neuroscience okay. and also the biologic sciences, even in epigenetics now. But if we don't have the environment and all the people interacting with the child and not just in a therapeutic setting demonstrating the care and the understanding around trauma-informed practices, we can undermine any therapeutic approach. If you're met in, an, in, a, in a traumatizing way most of the day, an hour of therapy is not going to help you. And so we have to have the through any door. And also there's a lot of self-care and engagement that has to happen. So giving somebody a therapy versus engaging them and helping them with their own reworking of their nervous system and their identity that can be often devastatingly damaged, a, self, a positive sense of identity and the ability to even reach out and have positive relationships. These are the hallmarks of trauma. So we have to have it be where we have relational positive relationships and constant affirmations of, that help us learn how to regulate our emotions and bodies and not be constantly triggered by most of what we're confronting, especially in the juvenile justice system. And if Dr. Shervington can respond as well. Um, yes. So after Katrina, there were no plans made for the children. And so what we started seeing in the schools was a lot of dysregulated behaviors. And so when my organization went in, we felt that the little things that we were doing as a community-based public health organization would not be enough. 
So I was going into the schools, the teachers, and thank you for mentioning the importance of teachers, doing professional developments for them, having them understand that the kids that we used in our public will campaign, that they're really sad, they're emotionally dysregulated, which is why we're seeing the behaviors, and they're not bad. And when we used that language, that hashtag, I think people began to see, and I think that's what we're all saying, that if you, if you could ever understand the suffering that some children are made to experience, and that they can still get up and uh, go to school, that if we could create these safe spaces in the schools, in the community, and when needed, because they're so damaged, they have to have the kind of professional help that together we could all change this problem. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask unanimous consent to uh, enter this letter into the record from the Jewish Federations of North America? They're expressing support addressing the impact of childhood trauma on older adults. We have 74 million baby boomers, many of whom will unfortunately have experienced trauma in their childhoods. And there's a need to conceptualize and address childhood trauma as a lifespan issue and create person-centered trauma-informed systems of care across health and social service systems for children and older adults. Uh, and that's never been more urgent because of obviously the size of the baby boom, boom generation. So if I could ask unanimous consent to enter that into the record. I'd Without be. objection, so ordered. Thank you. With that, we will recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss. Thank you very much. And let me begin just, uh, I hate that he had to, to leave early, but uh, uh, a big sincere thank you to Chairman Cummings. Uh, his his uh, final words to the first panel, uh, words of great heartfelt support and appreciation for them coming forward with their s stories. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think I speak on behalf of both sides of a genuine thanks to him, and I hope that will be relayed to him. Uh, Mr. Patterson, let me begin with you. I was extremely intrigued with, and thank you, spot on with um, talking about how trauma is a, a root cause of so many other issues. And you mentioned poverty itself being trauma driven. I'm just curious now that we are seeing uh, record low unemployment and so many different uh, positive uh, results in that regard, if having a dignified, stable job in and of itself can help either prevent trauma or promote healing. Well, sir, you're, you're exactly right. It's, it's one of those supporting factors that we need uh, as an adult to deal with the situations that we've had. Unfortunately, um, we are unable to get a lot of those people into the workforce because of very high ACE scores. So the, the, and you know, directly we're talking about way too much trauma to be able to not be involved in drugs. I mean, employers, many employers still have to have, for their workers' compensation, they've gotta have a drug test on file. Uh, they've gotta have a driver's license to get back and forth to work. Where we live, we don't have a massive transportation system, so you pretty much have to have a car to get to work. So the jobs are there, and it's certainly a supporting factor, but we need to be working early. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Hurry, we've got to do prevention work so that we don't have to deal with it, but for those traumas that have already occurred, we've got to do work early and often because the earlier we begin to intervene, the better the results of the therapy is. So you're Think absolutely very right. Wise. A, a, job, a job helps, but if you can't get the job. Exactly, and, and it's not a cure-all on its own. I mean, all of you, you've, you've spoken of family and faith and community and a host of other factors that are, are all involved and necessary. And I, again, just I won't have time to get to all of you, but thank each of you for the roles that you have in addressing this issue. Uh, Dr. Hurry, let me ask you, um, and this is dealing with uh, Generation Z. Uh, uh, there was a recent, in that age 15 to 21 ish, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, I saw a recent survey that said that uh, this particular generation lived with constant fear and anxiety since Donald Trump's presidential election. Um, 
I, that, that's one thing. My question is, does, does CDC fall into that type of anxiety as being trauma? Seems like we're talking two pretty diverse emotional experiences here. Um, when we're looking at adverse childhood experiences, it's things like you know child abuse um, it, or something you witness in a home. So that, that's how we define trauma. Okay, so stress in this regard, anxiety would not fall under trauma. I, I think if you look at what childhood trauma in itself is, if something um, does engender stress that could have a physiological or physical or mental health reaction, then you could say that it would be a trauma, but um, it wouldn't fit into not one of the Not to the same coded. extent, okay. All right, yes ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, we want to address ACEs because we'd like to promote flourishing, which has to do with having a sense of meaning and engagement in life and having hope and optimism. So anything that detracts from our ability to have a sense of hope and optimism in our lives and the ability to move forward and contribute in ways we think are valuable will diminish flourishing. And for people with trauma, which is about half of U.S. children, to on top of that start to live in a world where they think their opportunities are not there and that they can't quite figure out what the point is anyway, which is the bulk of the, of the friends of my nephew who's in that age bracket, that they can't figure out what there is to live for a lot of them. And this is not a small an, a number. So we do need to lift up a sense of meaning and hope and optimism as a way to prevent even future ACEs, even for kids who don't have them today. No question. But I think it's important. No question about that. I have a, probably a 10 second, while I've got you, probably a 10 second or less answer. You mentioned in your uh, opening statement about uh, illnesses that actually come from unaddressed trauma. Mm -hmm. And that caught my attention. Can you uh, give an example or like what yeah, kind of illness? Yeah, I mean, there's a book called The Autoimmunity Cure, which documents in very clear uh, scientific manner the way that the toxic stress from ACEs and childhood trauma directly impacts inflammation in the body and how that goes throughout all of the body systems. There's a book coming out called The Angel and the Assassin Soon that is examining the power of the microglial cell as an explanation for the brain pruning under stress that leads to mental illness. And so we have very strong ways that we know that toxic stress it gets embedded in the body and out pictures in autoimmune conditions, inflammation, and mental illness. This is very important that we understand how we function biologically based on our relational and lived experiences. Another example of root cause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Heiss. I'm going to just remind members, uh, we have members, we would all like to spend more time on this issue, and I would suggest that we need to, but we've got members who have commitments at other committees that we want to, who are trying to manage their schedules. So I'm going to keep people to the five minutes. Uh, and this is not an admonition to the next speaker. Um, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, you have uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you to all of our witnesses, both in our first panel and, and to you all right now for coming. I think, um, I was as was echoed earlier on both sides of the aisle, this is one of the more powerful and one of the most powerful and, and brave hearings that we've had uh, in a very long time, and I think there's a reason for that. Um, not only due to the expertise and the courage of our witnesses, but thanks to the tireless work of our chairman and the work of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, this is our first hearing on childhood trauma in the history of the Oversight Committee. And I just want to commend her and to commend our chairman for having the foresight and seeing that this is a macro issue of national consequence. Uh, Dr. Bethel, was I... Correct in hearing you say that half of children have some form of childhood trauma? Yeah, so using the CDC's definition and adapting it for uh, as appropriate for the National Survey of Children's Health, which we have an entire paper on if you want to read about it, we estimate that about half, almost 47% uh, of children have exposure to one or more ACEs. And of course, there's things that aren't measured in there, but because they're very co-occurring, we don't expect that we're missing children overall. Half. Yes, half, and that most of our children who bully, who, bu who are bullied, who have special health care needs, 70% who have an emotional, mental, behavioral condition that we also identify have ACEs. That's so it's half, but for the systems that we serve children in through federal programs, mm -hmm. most have ACEs. Yeah, and I think it's, it's important that we note for the record and for all people that Childhood trauma, as was noted um, by, by my colleague earlier, is a lifelong 
issue for people to live with and deal with, which, which means at some point in this country, at least one gen half of an entire generation will be dealing with trauma. Um, and when I think about this on a macro level, we think about how intergenerational trauma is not just familial, but it is cultural. Yes. Right now, when we talk, and what was alluded to earlier, when we think about the childhood drama in, induced by the opioid epidemic, uh, Dr. Shervington, I have to thank you so much for pointing out specifically the role of natural disasters in forming childhood traumas. Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Maria, we're already seeing children in schools in Puerto Rico exhibiting signs of post-traumatic stress, child separation at the border, the, Im the traumatic impacts of poverty alone, post-traumatic stress, domestic abuse. This is half of our country, half of our country's children. And so the, the health of our children is a, re is a reflection of the health of our nation. And how we're going to have to deal with these traumas is a collective responsibility on the public policy across all of our issues, whether it's homelessness, immigration, what have you. Uh, Dr. Shervington, uh, how does, you know, I want to zoom in on, on an issue that, they, as I mentioned, you highlighted, the effect of climate change and natural disasters on childhood trauma. Can you highlight how does a hurricane like Katrina or Maria, particularly one that has caused a lot of destruction, affect a child's mental health as they approach adulthood? Yes. Um Children need two things, to have caretakers who make them feel safe and to continue to feel that the environment in which they also live is safe. When Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans, all of that was shattered for the children and likewise I know in Puerto Rico and some of the other natural environments that happen all around. Unfortunately, what children are in, like double whammy, because usually they don't have the language to talk about how they're feeling, and oftentimes the adults they are depending on, they're dysregulated. They're just trying to figure out how to cope. Mm. Many families in New Orleans talked about, and in particular, say mothers who are breastfeeding, that it was very hard for them to connect with their child, that, usual, loving, warm, affectional bond that children need, that they weren't capable of doing that. We've even had some kids that we've identified there, and there's some science done by Dr. Yehuda, of what happens with mothers who are experiencing a trauma uh, such as a natural disaster, and how that gets transmitted in utero to the kids. So a couple of years ago, I was asked to deal with some kids who were just being born during Katrina, and they were extremely dysregulated. The um, principal had enough wherewithal to know there's something going on here. So we have to remember that when a natural disaster happens, and in particular where we have communities where the families are just barely making it, they're on the edge. So they don't have the comfort of thinking, oh, my insurance company is going to take care of this. That it really complicates and makes more complex what would naturally happen, like we saw in New York. A lot of families came back. There was so much support. We're still reeling from that in New Orleans, and I'm sure in Puerto Rico, where we did not get the amount of psychosocial and financial supports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for five minutes. Yeah, uh, very interesting hearing. I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, Percentage-wise, say, of people high school age in this country, um, I don't know whether we'll start with Ms. or Dr. Shevington or uh, Dr. Bethel, uh, how many people do you think should come in contact with a professional in this country to deal with their potential problems? Um, I think that what we need to do is make families... No, no, I, I, I want a kind of a number, like percentage-wise, how many say Americans, high school age, say 14 to 18, okay. you think should be coming into contact with uh, a professional? 
When we look at the data for youth who are in school who have two or more ACEs and the high prevalence of any number of conditions that they have, that's about 28% uh, of all children age 12 to 17, and much, much higher for certain subgroups according to income and race ethnicity. So it's a large group, but about one in four children in the country. Is that 28 percent for anything under the sun, or 28? Because I'm sure there, there are problems people have in addition to 28 percent have the exposure of two or more ACEs, where we see high okay. uh, rate, much higher rates of special health care needs, emotional, mental, behavioral problems, and lack of engagement of school at very high rates at that level. Um, almost more than half. So, and in certain populations, it's much higher. So I'm estimating that about 28% of youth 12 to 17 need some kind of special intervention probably right now. By a professional? Yes. Okay, and how many, how many do you think are getting help? Well, we know something from the National Survey of Children's Health that less than half of children who we already think need that kind of service, which means we're already diagnosing them, which we often don't find, are not getting in the mental health and treatment services that they need. So my guess is that when you also add in those who are at risk, that it's probably upwards of 60 to 70 percent. Let's talk to somewhere numbers that are harder, you know, more hard numbers to get at. Mm -hmm. um, do we have numbers like over the last 50 years, say the number of children who commit suicide or attempt suicide? We do have that data, actually. It's, of course, measured in the National Vital and Health Statistics. And for youth uh, 15 to, I think, 23, suicide is the number one cause of death. Can you, um, can you tell me where it is, say, today compared to 20 years ago, compared to 40 years ago? I guess that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for some time yes. comparisons. Dr. Shervington may know more, but I do know that it's increased, and I'd be happy to follow up with giving you very specific numbers on that. Dr dramatically increased? A little in Suicide rates have dramatically increased across the board. Actually, they're high for also middle-aged adults, um, and are, we're dying from the diseases of despair generally in this country with higher death rates than most other developed countries. So suicide has become an epidemic. Um, that is characteristic of our generation. Dramatically increased. Yes. Okay. Um, you know the percentage of the population on medications designed to deal with depression or to try to push off suicide. Do we know the percentage of the population, both, both kind of in the youth population, the high school years, and the adult population as a whole. Do we know what those numbers are? I don't have all those numbers, but we do collect data on the proportion of children, say, with ADHD and depression who receive medications. And once they're in treatment, which is a whole other thing of getting into treatment, the top priority uh, treatment is medication. However, many of the symptoms overlay with trauma. So one of the movements we'd like to see is that before we medicate our kids and put the numbers of kids on foster care on Abilify, which generally can prevent them from even engaging in school, first we need to assess and treat the trauma. And if we do use medications, to use them in a complementary way, because there's so many needs and opportunities okay. to help deal with the symptoms of mental health rather than treat and just medicate them. What I'd like, because you know, in, in analyzing this problem, it's nice to see over time what we're doing. Yeah. And, and how things are changing over time is is the number of I suppose both adults, but in particularly children, say high school to college years, say fourteen to twenty two, uh, committing suicide, attempting suicide, and uh, people taking legalized drugs mm -hmm. for depression or that sort of thing, and perhaps the number of professionals out there over the last fifty years, so we can kind of get a handle on what we're doing. And I'm going to defer we, to Dr. Hurry on some of that from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, but I do know that about half of youth say that they've thought about. Um, Dr. Hurry will okay. let you Well, she's got an assignment. Thanks. Do Dr. Bethel has given you an assignment. <laughs> Happy and to we're going to allow you to complete that assignment as well as, it, as long as it's done in a timely fashion. Got it. <laughs> So um, we released the vital signs this past year on suicide in the United States and saw that in 49 of the 50 states, suicide rates went up in the past 20 years. More than half the states um, went up 30%. So significant rates. We are seeing it going up highest in 
um, middle-aged adults, but we are seeing it go up in youth as well. And we've completed several outbreak investigations of youth suicides in the United States, most recently in Stark County, Ohio, where we saw that youth that had three or more adverse childhood experiences, 30% of them disclosed suicidal ideations. And if they also said they were using opioids, plus had those adverse childhood experiences, 80% disclosed suicidal ideation. I, I wanted to just say one thing, though, about the medications. I think it's important to realize suicide is not just about mental illness. More than half the people who died by suicide did not have a diagnosed mental illness. Oftentimes, it's precipitated by a traumatic event, loss of a job, um, partnership issues, economic issues. So it's not just mental illness, which is why I think resiliency is so key. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel. Um, I, I apologize. I've not been here for a lot of this testimony. I was here for the, the earlier panel, which was a very powerful one. Um, it was occurring to me as we were hearing from the earlier panel that the, this trauma, trauma gets delivered in a lot of different ways and, and, and what I mean by that is there's, there's these, in a sense, collective events of trauma um, like a mass shooting or the effect of a natural disaster. Then there's, um, there's trauma that's delivered in a very kind of specific and often hidden way. And um, the response to those, I guess, professionally and clinically may, may be different. Um, but I, I wondered if you could speak to, and if, if this has come up already, again, I apologize, but I wonder if you could speak to how critical, I've just come from a hearing um, in the Energy and Commerce Committee where we are um, reauthorizing community health centers, and many of them are connected to school-based health centers. And I've been an advocate for a long time trying to strengthen school-based health centers, and really aspire to where every school has a, a health suite that's there um, at every level, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and then making sure that among the professionals that are serving those centers are mental health professionals and counselors and so forth. I can't think of, maybe you can, but I can't think of a better place to bring those services to address m many of the um, trauma situations that we've discussed today than into our schools. Because you have a captive audience, you have the audience that's the most impacted at a young, a young age from trauma, whether it's something that's been experienced at home, whether it's one of these collective impacts, et cetera. Could you just speak to the, the value of school-based health centers, how we can uh, make them more robust in terms of the mental health component, and if you view that as a place where we can make tremendous progress in terms of addressing uh, childhood trauma. And, it, and it's open to anybody on the panel who would like to address the topic. Well, I'd I like guess, to go ahead. Um, as what I'd like to consider myself a community psychiatrist who is on the ground with our people after disaster and just people who've lived chronically through trauma, that schools are one of the most protective places if we can make them that for children. A lot of traumas happen in the home. We have situations, say for example, where a kid is being exposed to domestic violence. The police comes, take a parent, whomever was the perpetrator, one goes to the hospital, one goes to jail, and you know where the kid goes? To school. And that kid in school is not going to be able to concentrate and work that day. So I strongly support and beg for a scene schools as having health centers that can respond to their needs, social workers, and also doctors are important in that too. And again, having schools, the climate in the schools, being trauma-informed. If we could do that, we would go a long way. Every st many stories of survival I hear from adults, when they look back, it was a teacher. A teacher saw something, a teacher did something. So I just want to say how important health services in the schools are. I'm sorry. The federally qualified health center in Clark County 
uh, is a comprehensive medical home. And so we've already heard about how the mental health issues and the trauma affects long-term the health of the children. And so we, we take this fairly qualified health center that's a wraparound service for the children and their families, and then we extend it into the schools, which means the captive audience that you're talking about, right? And then we have comprehensive mental, behavioral, physical health all in one, not just for the children, but for their families as well. And the school is a walkable place for most of our co communities. And so then you have the ability for this all to happen in one place. It's, it's a perfect fix. It doesn't fix everything because we have to train the entire community to be trauma-informed. But if we're able to expand that into the schools, it, it, it really is a no-brainer. I'd just like to say a few more things. One is that you mentioned acute stresses, but chronic daily stress actually in the literature has been shown to be even more impactful over life, especially when acute stressors are often more often addressed because they're more obvious. So it's very important to know that. And also for schools that have that don't eliminate expulsion, um, that it, you know when children act out, it's very important that we consider not not no expulsion from school, but instead dealing with trauma, and that the first response is not reporting to child welfare because often the issues can be found earlier, and if teachers' only response is to be a first reporter, then they may not want to say anything because they don't want to destroy the family. And so we need a lot of ways to support children and families without expulsing, expulsing children from school and without reporting families to child welfare first. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller, for his first questions on this committee. And we're not always this bipartisan. Hopefully this is a, <laughs> you're gonna change things. I, I hope to be able to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanna thank the panel and also the panel th this morning. Um, you know, it's hard, you can't even imagine uh, people that have suffered the, uh, the things that have happened uh, to the people here today and, and people that are continuing to happen around our nation. It is, it is tragic. And I, I just heard a couple things that I want to make sure I understand. And it, it dealt with some of the issues uh, with ACEs. And I, I heard poverty mentioned quite a few times. And just some, and it, uh, Dr. Bethel, you, I read through the graphs that you had. And it seemed that in, in cases of poverty, if I understood what, what we were given, uh, that the ACEs tend to be higher for, for for I'll say kids and young adults uh, that live in poverty. Is my understanding correct from the information? Yeah, the information I gave you was that for those for 200% or above the federal poverty level, which is 43% of children, they represent 57% of children with ACEs. And then as you saw the, the in, income increased, then a decline in the ACEs. Yes, except for it's still very high in all income groups. And, but one, and I will say that it's very agnostic according to income once experienced in terms of the effects on health. Okay. The, the other thing you mentioned uh, during, I think it was Mr. Heiss was asking some questions, you mentioned about um, young adults, a sense of purpose and uh, being able, you know, that's creating some issues too with young adults. Is my understanding of that correct too? Yeah, we just published a paper in Health Affairs about child flourishing, one of which is whether children are curious and interested in learning, able to de um, devise and fulfill uh, tasks and goals that they have, and remain calm and in control when faced with a challenge. And only about 40% of school aged children in the country meet all three of those criteria. So we need to proactively promote flourishing to help children grow into adults that can have a sense of meaning, purpose, positive relationships, hope, and optimism. And that is a cross-cutting need, regardless of ACEs. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. And, you know, there, there's also a study from the uh, Early Childhood Poverty and Adult Attainment Behavior and Health. The University of Chicago did a report that showed that when uh, there's an increase in, in income, that helps the children's future income increase, a, a modest increase in income helps a children's or a child's income later on increase by 17%, which I think would help some of those issues, particularly for the kids 
in poverty. Absolutely. Yeah, is, that, is that something you're familiar with, and do you, do you agree that that might be helpful? Well, the literature is pretty clear about that. Um, there's a lot of co-occurring issues for children in poverty, and so when you parse them out, it can be difficult to isolate. Is it the income? Is it the things that the, you know, other things that have gone on? But um, a researcher, Renee Joyton Barrett, um, has researched a lot how, to, how there's mobility in poverty and often dealing with the issues of trauma that are intergenerational can help families actually move out of poverty and take advantage of the supports that are available to them. We do have an issue of getting people to take advantage of supports that are offered because one of the things trauma does is it can stall the self-care instinct and the ability to actually activate the will to be well. And so we offer things and then they don't necessarily able to follow through and use the resources. So I think hand in hand, we have to deal with the trauma of poverty and the trauma of ACEs simultaneously. Yeah. I, I, th I think you know there's a lot of value in making sure that people have more income and more money to take care of the needs they have, uh, which you know um, you know getting back to that that small increase uh, in in 2017 into 2017 the tax cut bill was passed and more families according to the tax policy center you know are keeping $1,600 more a year or getting $1,600 more a year back in their and their income taxes, which I think has to be a benefit to some of the poor families to be able to take care of themselves and have some more of those, uh, um, help them create more of a sense of worth because they have more control over what's happening in their lives. Uh, so I guess I would, I would just say I think that's a positive impact, the fact that President Trump got that through Congress and, and people are keeping more of the money they earn. Uh, so that should be helpful. Um, I would say, are there other things that we could do or policies that we could enact that would help people uh, be able to direct more of their own, their own resources that get them more sense of worth uh, rather than, you know, just, uh, I think it takes everything. I think there's a lot of things we talked about, but what other things, you know, should we make those tax cuts permanent? What kind of things should we do to have an ongoing, an ongoing success of people coming out of poverty? Anything that we can do to build resiliency in our children to be able to handle the adverse childhood experiences that they have is going to be positive. And so if we're able to put prevention programs in place, if we're able to, you know, a rising tide does float all boats, uh, but, but your boat, if your boat has holes in it, it's going to be pretty tough for that to take effect. So we need to help the people patch up the holes so that that rising tide can help everyone. And I would just add, we have technical packages on a lot of our violence prevention strategies and economic supports is one of the pillars. Things like earned income tax credit, child care subsidies have been shown to reduce child maltreatment or associations with it. So that coupled with tax savings are a positive thing for, for our families and for people in poverty. Thank you. I want to thank the gentleman. His time is up. I would say up. if they're working, then they can benefit from that. But having a living wage and being able to actually manage to where uh, you even earn enough to have much taxes taken out, I think, is probably um, preliminary even for many of the families we're discussing. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the chair now wants to recognize the congresswoman from Massachusetts and also acknowledge her leadership on this issue. Ms. Presley, your five minutes. Thank you. Um, I did want to also just thank uh, uh, Representative Sarbanes for his leadership and partnership on the issue of school-based uh, health centers. Um, uh, there but for the grace of God go I, I can say with certainty that he was a school nurse um, that saw the signs of trauma and abuse in my own life. And um, it is so important that the school community are trained in these indicators because yes, there are children that act out, but there are many more that shut down. And I was one of those children. Um, I do wanna say though, I've always taken issue with the term that children are resilient because I think it infers for people um, that they get over things. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that uh, no child, no person is really that resilient. What we are is delayed. And these things do all show up in some way, form, or shape. Uh, in our lives. It presents differently for everyone. And I think ultimately what we want to see in our school communities is a paradigm shift in culture where people will ask, what happened to you instead of what is wrong with you? And, and that is a distinctive shift that needs to occur. But it's also important to note that our children are not independent contractors. You know, they are part of a broader ecosystem of family and community. And the best gift that we can give any child is a stable adult. But most adults 
are also destabilized, right? And so when you talk about the issue of trauma and the stigma and the stereotyping and the one-dimensional narrative, I wanna say when I first started talking about this issue uh, in running for the Boston City Council, um, that people uh, were worried that I was coddling children or that I was feeding a stereotype of who is impacted by, by trauma. And that's why uh, the testimony of our witnesses earlier is so important in what you've offered here today, is that hardship and trauma do not discriminate. Uh, there are some disruptions and hardships that are disproportionately bore by others uh, based on historical legacies and systems and structures, um, but it does not discriminate. And so uh, bearing that in mind, this is a public health uh, issue an epidemic, and it must be treated as such, and we need to be not only coordinated, but equitable. There is no hierarchy of hurt, and I appreciate your pushing for us to address this in a comprehensive way. Um, I convened the first hearing in the Boston City Council, a listening-only hearing to hear from 300-plus families who are survivors of homicide victims, and that was where it was underscored for me that it's critical that this work be survivor-led. Um, my district is uh, coming off of the heels since July 3rd of 18 shootings. And so I recently uh, convened and assembled um, uh, civic leaders, faith leaders, uh, survivors, advocates, um, family members of offenders uh, to all come together. And so I request unanimous consent to enter into the record written testimony from the Office of Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute, uh, which has an incredible national model and blueprint for this work, Wellspring mentors, Mass General Hospital, and residents and community leaders across the Massachusetts 7th. Um, picking up on that note of the need for us to be coordinated, uh, there were medical professionals that were in this meeting and they said that they've been trained to stitch up victims, and many of them were repeat victims. Mm -hmm. But it was only recently they thought to ask about who are they and what are the needs of those victims that were coming into their ER and they were stitching up. Um, and, and why is it that they keep coming back, right? So uh, I just wanted to uh, lift up something from the Administration for Children and Families. It says African Americans experience generations of slavery, segregation, and institutionalized racism that has contributed to physical, psychological, and spiritual trauma. Dr. Shervington, when the root causes that often lead to trauma are so entrenched in our very infrastructure, discriminatory housing, policies, health and racial disparities, how do we respond? Um, I think, as you said, a real comprehensive approach. I tend to see these issues across the social ecological model. So as a physician, as a psychiatrist, at the individual level, when the harm is done, we need to fix that for the person. And I would just like to underscore what you said. How many times can you kick someone down and expect them to get back up? And usually it's in those systems and those structures. And so as public health practitioners or clinicians, we have to advocate for those kinds of policies that are going to look at those inequities and try to fix them. So that we can't do them alone. And so we have to be in partnership with those in our communities. And it has to be community driven how these inequities play out. We have to work with them, we're not isolated. So in our emergency room in New Orleans, the public um, emergency room, the trauma surgeons, they have, the, they have built in some supports where at least they're screening for PTSD in the victims who are coming in, or I should say survivors. They're working with them, but they're also going into the community, working with community-based advocates who are really looking at these structural factors that help to perpetuate the poverty and the violence that can happen when communities are disconnected. Thank you. Thank you. Your time has expired, and Mr. Gibson is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Gibbs, thank you. Gibbs, excuse me. <laughs> thank you. Oh, hi. Thank, oh, thank, 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 thank you, Chairman. Uh, f first of all, I want to associate myself uh, with uh, Chairman Cummings' closing remarks on the first panel, and uh, I see some of the witnesses are still here, and you really are heroes for what you're doing, it, and, and God bless you. Um, you. You know, sitting through listening to all this has been interesting, very educational for me, but uh, I think about the trauma causes, you know, 
I put them in a couple of categories, poverty, abuse, drugs, I think we're all in agreement on that. So I just want to be clear, because it came up in an earlier uh, question, uh, in, the, in the tax bill uh, that we passed here in late uh, December of 17, uh, we did put a 2,000, we doubled the ta child tax credit from 1,000 to 2,000 dollars, but even if you don't owe any taxes, a, a family doesn't owe any taxes, there's a refundable tax credit of $1,400 per child for their dependent children, and uh, they just need to file, I guess. So that's important at helping the uh, poverty side, uh, even if they aren't working. Just want to make that clear. Um, what I want to follow up a little bit on is, uh, I know Mr. Henry, Mr. Patterson, and, and welcome from Ohio too, and, and uh, I know Springfield well, even though I live about two and a half hours from there. But um, just to follow up, uh, we're talking about coordination, and, and uh, uh, I know Mr. Henry talked about more money is always nice, but then we got to make sure that the local people or entities are com are committed, and but then this coordination thing, and, and just a couple of examples. I know we have the WIC program, the Women's Infant Children's Program under USDA, and, and uh, uh, those uh, social workers go out to, the, to those lower income families after a, a, a child's born and help with uh, those uh, uh, nutrition needs. As an example, if they see something, is there a follow-up? Uh, like Mr. Pass has been the health commissioner there in, in, in Clark County in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, what kind of followed up coordination? And then I guess another example would be all my children now are in their 30s are all grown up, but I remember uh, one time when my oldest child broke his arm and we were in the emergency room about at uh, 9 o'clock at night. And uh, I felt like I was on the fifth degree, uh, you know, the questions, questions, make sure it wasn't child abuse. And, and uh, so I, I just want to uh, see if we're not in silos, what kind of follow up. Uh, and then also follow up with, um, uh, in the, in the, with a, a faith-based community, you know, if it's needed, because I think uh, uh, there's a lot of good things. I know Mr. Henry's talked about if one church just adopt uh, one, one child to make a big difference, and we know one person can make a big difference. And so what I'm trying to say is uh, uh, what the coordination we have, is there something more that we could do at the federal level to help with that coordination? So I'll just open it up to, to you two gentlemen since you've got the experience. Go ahead. What I would first say is that the, uh, the WIC program model in Ohio is typically that the, the families come to us. And so sometimes we see things and then as mandated reporters, we do what we need to do. Um, we're lucky in Clark County that our WIC division and our early childhood divisions are co-located. And so if, if there's an issue, they can literally walk the people down the hall and do a warm handoff to make sure that there's follow-up there. Um, so that can happen pretty easily. Uh, the issue, you know, in that case really becomes we're not seeing them in their homes, and that's why we have an early childhood division that does home visiting, which is in fact uh, funded by you, and that's a major impact for us to be able to go in. We know the research tells us that us being in the home actually prevents child abuse. It doesn't prevent all of it, but it reduces the instance of child abuse because we're in the home. And so we continue to do that to work with the families and build the programming so that they can be successful. And we do have the relationship. We've talked several times, you've heard today, about uh, one of the ways that you deal with trauma is you have a caring adult, you have a relationship with someone, and that's what that home visiting program actually does, is provides a caring adult who gets to know the family, the family gets to know them, they build a trust, they build a relationship, they build accountability, and they build a plan on where they're how's, going. How's your relationship? I know you're, you're semi-rural, kind of your rural county, but you got Springfield, it's not, not a large city, with a faith-based community involvement and try to, to try to. Well, our faith-based community is involved in lots of ways. Uh, one of the things they're doing is they help supplement where the programs can't purchase certain items for the families, uh, either for comfort or for safety. Uh, our faith-based communities are contributing that to our programming, um, but they're also beginning to work more with our community health improvement plan and being involved in the results. So they're actually from the pulpit sending the messages yep. about health, about trauma, about mental health, about opioids, uh, and that's making a big difference. Yeah, I, I've seen in my area, uh, my stakeholder meetings, especially in the opioid crisis, uh, faith-based community definitely has a role to play, and, and, and in partnership with all the other stakeholders. And, and that's I think we're trying. To, I think in Ohio, 
uh, and the opioid issue was starting to turn the corner in the aspect of awareness and education. You first got to be aware of the problem and recognize the problem. And I think we've turned the corner of that aspect, even though we still have a crisis. Don't get me wrong. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to this, and I think it really relates to what you're saying about faith-based organizations and the role they can play, which is we really don't ask families themselves to reflect on what their assets and needs and their current concerns are and to set their agenda for the priorities and the things they think they need help with that can then be shared with the wide array of professionals that help them so that we base what we're doing on the needs of the family and also support them in a reflective process to start to see what are the things that they have as strengths but also the things they need help with and we can do a lot of standardized screening to bring it right to the table so we don't spend all of our time in well visits and all of our time in these programs asking families multiple times about ACEs. Every door they walk in would be a disaster, not trauma-informed. I think churches could be a great place to work with and help coach families in thinking through what's happening for you, what are your strengths, what do you want, what are your hopes, and also what do you need from the systems that serve you. And if we use IT platforms, we've been working on something called the Care Path for Kids that's family-driven where they own this tool and they can send it to whoever they want. And so that WIC program, Head Start, their home visitor, their doctor, all can see in one place what is it that we're dealing with, what is it we have strengths, and what do we want to have happen. So this is very important, and I think churches would be a great place to implement that. Thank, thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now recognize Ms. Kelly of Illinois for five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. And again, thank the uh, witnesses earlier. Uh, all too often in communities across the country, especially for communities I represent, I represent the Chicagoland area, the south side of Chicago, and I go 100 miles south, so I'm urban, suburban, and rural. And in Chicago alone, and the number might have changed because it's a new day, there have been 240 people shot and killed already this year and 1,116 shot, but not killed, shot and wounded since January. And can you imagine being a child? I know we talk a lot about mass shootings, but these are everyday occurrences in some of our neighborhoods. So imagine being a child and having to witness your loved one lose their life or dramatically limit their physical capabilities. It's an ongoing um, occasion. And I know one of my Ministers, we talk about PTSD, post-traumatic, and he always says, no, it's present traumatic because we live with this every day. You know, we don't send our kids outside. They can't play in the park. They're scared to walk to school. Some don't feel safe in the school because of the um, relationship with the police in some of the areas um, in Chicago. So from your research, um, what are some of the characteristics that can be observed from children who who grow up in this in these conditions, do they graduate from high school? Are they likely, you know, to have successful careers? Because too many of them, when you say, what do you want to do, they don't even see themselves living past 20, possibly. Um, yeah, um, sometimes we'd be surprised with our kids who have those experiences. When you ask them, um, where they'll be in, say, 10 years, they say on a T-shirt, um, RIP. Mm -hmm. And so it has a tremendously profound effect on children growing up in this violence. We have done some work in our organization where we've looked at the data because we screen kids for signs and symptoms of PTSD. And I agree with you, it's present, it's persistent, it's not really post. And we find a large number, similar to Chicago, were exposed to violence. At least 20% of the kids in our public schools have actually witnessed someone being killed. It gives them a very shortened sense of their own lives. One kid said to me, I don't know where I'm going to school. I ain't going, you know, I'm not learning. I'm thinking about can I get home safely. We do know that if we can intervene, when children are exposed to this level of violence, if we can intervene with them and help them process how it makes them feel, what it does to their feelings and to their thoughts, we can shift into that space where they are more thriving and flourishing because they can understand this is in the past, but maybe there are things that can be better in the present and the future. 
I just, I, I, I talk about uh, the south side of Chicago, but actually in my rural area, I just met with 50 uh, children from the seventh grade to seniors in high school and the things they shared with me. And someone asked about suicide and farmers are a fast growing group that are committing suicide because of what's happening you know, in their lives lately. The other concern is, um, is uh, one of the witnesses today talked about, uh, I think she said they have one counselor for 400 kids and some of our schools, it's one counselor per or social worker um, per two or three schools, you know, so that's something that's imperative that we get um, more counselors in to schools and in Chicago, some of the mental health facilities, I think there was six uh, shut down, so not even access, you know, uh, in the neighborhoods to go and get help. So that's something that we definitely, and I know the new mayor is interested in changing that so uh, people have some place to go to get help. And in my rural communities, they're doing uh, telehealth to help with that also. But um, uh, just the effect of not having, you know, counselors to turn to. Is, is a very big issue. But I just want to thank all of you for your commitment. And um, uh, we're seeing the same thing. There are jobs, but um, you know, people don't have the, the uh, technical acumen to take the job. They don't have to have a college degree. They could have high school. But because of the other things going on in their lives, it's been very difficult for a lot of my manufacturers, in particular, to fill positions. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chairman recognizes uh, the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity for this hearing today. Uh, you know, it, my, my grandmother was actually the head of the North Dakota Mental Health Association for 25 years, so I grew up um, dealing with this. And when you're talking about farmers, uh, you want to talk to uh, rural German farmers in the 1970s and 80s about talking about their feelings. Uh, that, that is a job that was, di it's difficult to do now. Imagine doing it almost a generation ago. So we dealt with that. I also spent 10 years as a criminal defense attorney. And I can tell you without a doubt that 85 to 90 percent of my clients, particularly first time offenders under the age of 25, you can trace back to lots of different reasons. Um, and I think ideally we'd all like to see a school nurse, a school counselor, and a school resource officer in every school all, uh, all across the country. But we also know that the pipeline for those, even, even, even if we fully funded it for every rural school, every urban school, every whatever, we know the pipeline of the people coming into those degrees doesn't fill those things. Um, so what, what I've, I think we've done, both in criminal justice and in schools, which I think is great, is we have gotten law enforcement and teachers to be better at recognizing some of these things at an earlier age. I think one of the things, I mean, the number one issue for North Dakota teachers is school is teacher safety right now. I mean, that's, that's as about as heartland and as rural as it gets. So this is not only an urban issue, this is not only an East Coast or a West Coast issue. What I get concerned about is that we ask them to do too much often. I mean, if they're getting too, doing an in-service every six, six months, that does not make them a child psychologist. It does not make them a child social worker. And it actually chases teachers out of the profession. Um, and we're dealing with, what, like I said, I mean, if you're in a rural area in North Dakota, you're a thousand miles away from a counselor and telemedicine and those types of things can help. I'm glad we're talking about faith-based treatment because oftentimes in those small communities, that's where the communal resource is. But there's also, I mean, there's other challenges. I mean, if you've done this for a long time and you walk around, I think we could walk into any fourth grade class and watch it for a week and have a pretty good idea of who we would probably want to talk to. But, and we've talked about you're talking about apps and family based, but unfortunately, a lot, I mean, holding parents accountable only works if the parents are involved and want to be held accountable. So we end up dealing with some of these constitutional issues. We deal with some of these issues about family involvement, and often our, our most at risk kids, one of the reasons they're most at risk is because their parents aren't involved for whatever, for whatever reason. I mean, there's, there's good reasons, there's bad reasons, there's all of those things. Um, but we've been doing it, uh, we've, so we've had to get creative. We've explored innovative ways to improve services for students um, through interconnected 
systems framework and blends school mental health and positive, positive behavioral interventions for schools. I mean, it reduces barriers to learning, identifies needs early, engages in effect and treatment often, and improves educational life and outcome for students, which it's, uh, and I do have to give a shout out to uh, Jason Hornbacher, who is doing this in the Bismarck Public School System, because I, all the policy in the world doesn't work unless you have really great people advocating this. So, I, I mean, my questions are, are, one of the key tenets of that model is, uh, is a broad network of connectivity for children. Um, Dr. Aure, I suppose, but anybody can answer this. Can you give us any detail on, I mean, how we integrate community and faith-based and just the different group? I mean, every community has different resources available. We just have to look to them. I mean, are there programs and models that have worked in other <laughs> places that everybody should be looking at? So a, a couple of things. One is we're doing this right now in um, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Detroit to where we're working with some of the cities to look at what programs we already have in place and really helping convene them because oftentimes I think like Mr. Patterson was saying, there's lots of programs out there and, and you need to convene them and link appropriately. So I think that's really a key role for public health with the school system. I think even taking a step back earlier and looking at within schools, it's great to have that response, but really integrating things like social emotional learning, like good behavior game, um, incredible years type programs, that's primary prevention and gives kids coping skills, empathy, conflict management, life skills, so that when these stressors do occur, they're already prepared and that helps with the need for counselors. I'd like to speak to the issue um, that you raised about if you can't involve the families and the way that we really need to leverage well child care visits and others earlier on before children are even in school so that parents are really supported in their own well-being and their own understanding about being involved without and de deactivating the shame of having issues so that we really create a norm that's more compassionate and so that they can stay involved through school and it's not just band-aiding kids. But I also wanna raise something called the Self-Healing Communities Model, which was implemented in about 42 communities in Washington State. And through these programs, when they evaluated them, that those communities that were able to come together and integrate school and child welfare and healthcare mm -hmm. and churches and others really saw a reduction in at least five kinds of outcomes, things like youth violence, substance abuse, teen pregnancy, and suicide. The, the reduction in caseload alone for child welfare and juvenile justice yielded about $176 per dollar invested. Wow. So $3.4 million invested and a $601 million just for the few things that you could measure. So the power of self-healing communities coming together, but what they need is support. Process needs to be supported in this time to be invested. And then once we get those under our, our belly, you know, and we know how to do it, it can be self-perpetuating. But right now, these skills are not in place. And I Thank agree you. with that, and I know my time is up, and I'd say the process needs to be supported, but we also always have to recognize it needs to be flexible because we have to Absolutely. deal with these things with, with the resources we have, that's not right. the resources we wish we had. And that's the self-healing communities model. I encourage you to look at it. Thank you. In the spirit of self-healing, the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. I thank the chair, and I would first like to add my congratulations to our colleague, Ms. Presley, for the historic nature of this hearing. I wish attendance were better because every one of my colleagues needs to hear your testimony. And not just, as often happens in Congress, not just pay it lip service. Because this is pretty rare to have an entire panel that's genuinely on the side of children, the angels. It's also pretty rare to have an entire panel these days that's on the side of science, which translated means government-funded research. So people have to get over it and support it. I have a particular um, need to single out my friend and colleague, Mr. Henry from Tennessee, a remarkable public servant. Now, how he ever overcame the handicap in Madison, Tennessee of having been raised by, I'm guessing, 50 Republican relatives, that's <laughs> quite... <laughs> That might be an ace, I don't know. <laughs> but his career in our state legislature, where he was a giant, his career in the business community, serving the underserved, his career in the executive branch, not only in the cabinet, but as deputy governor, 
is extraordinary. So I thank you. I wish we had more people like you. In fact, if you want to run for office in Tennessee statewide, since Democrats have a difficult time doing that, you might be the best we can get. But I don't want to hurt your campaign with an endorsement right now. But the elephant in the room is this. Can we really help our kids in states that have refused to even extend Medicaid? Mr. Henry worked hard. Governor Haslam was in sure Tennessee plan, which you and I were both strongly for, but our legislature would not even give the time of day. So our state is giving up a billion dollars a year in health care for poor families, mainly kids. So I would like, first like to ask our three doctors on the panel, is it possible to help kids, as you suggest, in a state that refuses to even extend Medicaid and to give up all that money that could be used for health care for these poor families? What is the answer to that question? Because that is politically the most pressing question that at least 14 states face. And my response is not political, it's just human. As a physician, I have seen when a child really needs help, that because they don't have the insurance, and for poor children it's usually Medicaid, they do not get the type of service they need, the quality of service they need. Unfortunately, what I have seen in another experience when I worked in forensics, where there were people on death row, and as a psychiatrist, I was asked to see them. I could get a lot of money at that point when all the damage had been done. And so I would like for us to really think about and back to prevention. If for many of those men that I saw, the traumas that they experienced, if there had been access to health care at that time, and they perhaps would have been referred to some therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, maybe they wouldn't end up now with someone like myself trying to get the mercy and not the death penalty. So we need to have our children have access to health care. So I'd like to address your question from a data point of view, but first from a personal point of view. I was one of the first babies on Medicaid in California, and I was hospitalized 11 times and saw a lot of ER doctors, and I would be dead without Medicaid. Uh, there is no question about it, and I can tell you my story another day, but I would be dead. Now, I wish the providers were more trauma-informed because they could have done a lot to help my mother which is really what who needed help, right? So we need to integrate Medicaid services to be family-based, not only just for children, but to allow pediatricians and family physicians to cut across and help the mother or the father, because that is often what needs to happen. To help children, we have to help adults. Now for a data picture, um, this is in my testimony written, there's wide variation across states in how many children have special health care needs based on whether they have ACEs. Wide variations in terms of whether they have emotional, mental, behavioral problems, bully, whether they're flourishing, whether their families stay hopeful in difficult times. And I can show you that in the states that do not have more generous Medicaid benefits, that there tends to be higher rates of these problems. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, the chair will now recognize Mr. Raskin of Maryland for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, salute uh, Ms. Presley for uh, having the idea for this excellent and important panel discussion. Um, let's see. Uh, Ms. Bethel, I want to start with you. you. Are you at Johns Hopkins? You, I am. Uh, you are good. Okay, so you are a Marylander, so I want to start with you. Um, the, um, the question before us today is important, obviously, for humanitarian reasons, and this is a week where a lot of us are focused on the condition of children in our care and custody. Um, but it's also important uh, in terms of the future. Um, I saw a, a documentary about uh, abuse of kids at a Catholic girls' school in Baltimore. Um, which is just utterly horrifying um, and shocking. But um, how do you break the, uh, 
how do, how do you break the cycle of trauma? Because the, the people who are, who, who are um, the victims of it can themselves become the perpetrators, right, later. So what do we know about that? I mean, I'd like Dr. Shervington also to contribute, but what we know is that when people experience trauma and become perpetrators, they're deep in their, um, in their own self-shame and their lack of self-worth and the inability to imagine it could be different and have a lot of hopelessness. And so one of the first things we need to do is recognize that until people have something to live for and they can be, have their shame deactivated so they can understand that something happened to them, because that's what the pattern is, that we're not gonna be able to really engage them in the, rep, in the kinds of healing processes that they have to go through to right. not be facing an amygdala that basically hijacks them with anger and meet, leads them to lash out that they often regret later, but it does damage because these are very basic biologic, mental, and neural capacities to be able to handle stress. And when you've had that happen to you as a child and you become a parent, it can be almost impossible to control yourself if they're on the perpetrating side. So, you know, we really need to protect children, and we also need to help the perpetrators in very uh, clear ways who are often really suffering themselves. Thank you. Um, Mr. Patterson, um, the Cincinnati Inquirer says that 1.2 million Ohio residents have gotten health care coverage through the Medicaid expansion. Of those, about 630,000 received treatment for mental health or drug uh, abuse problems, and 290,000 people left Medicaid after getting a job or increasing their income. What would the impact be of rolling back the expansion of Medicaid coverage in Ohio today for children who've experienced trauma? Well, it would be a devastating impact because those perpetrators who are able to now seek treatment through mental health services, through for their for their mental illness or their substance abuse illness uh, would no longer have that capacity. And I would tell you that in, in our community, if you don't have Medicaid or you don't have another insurance, you're not getting treatment. There is no free treatment. And so the cycle will continue or will actually get worse if we pull back what happened. I'm sure you know in our state, you know, our legislature didn't act on that either. Right. Well, I appreciate that answer. Um, Mr. Henry, the program that you led in Tennessee is called Building Strong Brains Tennessee, emphasizing that brain function and uh, neurological resiliency can be strengthened through specific interventions, a theory that was informed by several scientific uh, symposia and studies and findings. Can you discuss the importance of drawing on scientific data to create public policies that address the impact of childhood trauma? I think that, um, <laughs> that it's incumbent upon all of us to draw from everywhere we can. And, and you know the, um, the impact of us not getting the expansion dollars. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing what we would be, where we would be right now if we did. And, uh, did, did you try to use science in the process of convincing people in Tennessee? Of the we couldn't get it on the agenda. Neither speaker would bring it to the floor. Um, the, I, maybe you're the right person to comment on this or any, anyone else who has expertise on it, but I was fascinated by the finding uh, that kids who experience trauma are more than doubly uh, more likely to be bullied by other kids, which, which was a shocking thing to read. You would think it would be the opposite, that the kids would be more sympathetic and tender, but what, what is the basis for that? finding and uh, and what can be done about that problem. And before you go ahead, uh, Mr. Okay. Raskin, I'm advised that votes are about to be called, so I want to get uh, as much testimony and questions as possible in. So if you could be concise in your response, yeah, and we'll go I'll, to Mr. Arruda. I'll just say that actually someone earlier said that, you know, there's different ways that people act out in trauma. They act out, and it's more assertive and aggressive, and we can see those behaviors, but there's also an acting in. And children who have ACEs can often appear to be very vulnerable and to be victims of people who are more perpetrating, but they both share probably a lot of ACEs. Most of the children who bully have ACEs and most of the children who are bullied have ACEs. It thank you, important point. Mr. Rode. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank 
all of you as well as the previous panel for joining us today. And as Chairman Cummings said at the very beginning, I apologize I haven't been able to be here for the entire testimony, but uh, fortunately we've had the opportunity to read it in advance and, uh, and dig into this uh, issue uh, deeper. I'd like to talk about homelessness because it's an issue that's been very important to uh, my wife and I. Uh, when we were in our 20s, my wife read an article about the plight of homeless families. And at that time, uh, the typical situation is you lose your job, you lose your home, you live in a motel, hotel, you live in your car uh, when that money runs out, and then you go to a shelter where often they would take the families and they would send the men and boys 15 years and older to the men's shelter and the women and the children to the women's shelter when all that they really have left at that time is the family unit. And we know separating uh, kids from, from their parents is not good, whether it's uh, due to homelessness or due to being on the, on the border. Uh, we, right now in America, have 550,000 Americans experiencing homelessness. And about one third of that population is children. Uh, in my county, Orange County, California, it's 7,000 homelessness and 1,000 homeless children. Uh, with approximately 27,000 children experiencing uh, uh, home insecurity on an annual basis. Uh, the annual report on the conditions of children in Orange County states, quote, the high mobility, trauma, and poverty associated with homelessness and insecure housing creates educational barriers, low school attendance, developmental, physical, and emotional problems for children. And Dr. Shervington, in your written testimony, you identified homeless youth as showing higher and multiple rates of exposure. Uh, would you agree that reducing the number of homeless uh, families and youth must be part of the effort to reduce childhood trauma? I can be brief, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And the center also stated children in previously homeless families receiving rental assistance vouchers change schools less frequently and are much less likely to be placed into foster care than other homeless families, one study found. Uh, their families also experience significantly less food insecurity and domestic violence. And again, Dr. Shervington, why is having a safe and stable home so important to a child's development? Um, children really do rely on the capacity of their caretakers to create an affectional bond with them. It's within that experience that they're going to learn that the world is safe, that it's secure, that they can begin to create their own identities of themselves and other people. When that is interrupted, then we, we set the foundation for the inability of that child to pull on their own inner ability to be resilient, plus all the other factors that they will Thank you. Encounter. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record reports that show childhood homelessness and housing insecurity is associated with the factors I uh, pointed out and the stories uh, regarding critical and innovation work being done by organizations across Orange County, including the Family Solutions Collaborative, Families Forward, Mercy House, First Five Orange County, Orange County United Way, and Jamboree Housing to get families off the streets and connect them with the services that they need to succeed. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, I think what's very important too in this discussion is that when we have preventive uh, opportunity to address homelessness, it's actually a lot cheaper than dealing with the consequences of that trauma down the road. And uh, uh, I do want to take the remainder of my time and uh, yield to uh, uh, Congresswoman Presley for uh, the remaining time. Go ahead, Congresswoman Presley. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk about uh, the criminal justice system. Um, an estimated 90% of children in the juvenile justice system have at least two ACEs, which is what was testified to early, with 27% of boys and 45% of girls in the justice system having five or more ACEs. What is the impact of a punitive response to trauma rather than a public health approach? 
Well, I think, I wish we had a lot more time, but basically when you're traumatized, you already, your sense of self-worth and hope in life is often very diminished. And when you continue to be treated like that, it is diminished further. And the neurobiological effects of those um, identities of I'm not worth anything, I don't have hope, basically perpetuate continued burning and pruning in your brain and lack of ability for self-care. And you're not able to really take advantage of any of the supports that might be given in the justice system to help you. So on the one hand, we're saying, help yourself, fix yourself, do all these healthy behaviors, and then being treated like that, which it systematically prevents a person from being able to even take advantage of the support they're being offered. So until we help people understand it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And it's not what happened to you, it's how it impacted mm -hmm. you, and getting close to that, and it's not how it impacted you, it's what can we do about it? And they're on board with that because they feel like somebody cares about them and they're valuable while they're learning to care about themselves again, which they may have never even felt that I am worth anything. And that is a very common report that we hear from young people today. Thank you. So. And I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to pick up, and, and again, I thank uh, Harley, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you referenced a, um, a self-healing and community model, which does need to be the goal ultimately so that we have something that is self-perpetuating and has that agency and is sustainable because not only do we need a response that is coordinated and comprehensive, that is equitable right. mm -hmm. for everyone from the survivor of sexual assault to the survivor of a shooting uh, on a city block to a mass shooting right. to uh, PTSD from war, comprehensive and equitable. Um, but it has to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I, I do worry about our ability to just have systems uh, of, which have often already failed people, mm -hmm. right? Broken systems creating broken people um, and whether or not they can even offer a sustainable s solution in the long run. So how do we get to that? And could you tell me the, um, the model, where is it from? The self-healing community self model? self-healing communities model. And doctor, if, if once again, admonition oh, is I'm try so to be sorry. concise, just because okay. votes are about yes, to be I'm called. So I, I can, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. I can provide you with a specific reference from that, but it's in Washington State and it's easily found. Robert okay, Johnson great. Foundation has uh, published on that. So I can definitely okay, provide well, that. But until the we'll community's engaged in driving the change and working with systems who are receptive to their needs and ideas about what they need, I don't think we'll ever have a sustainable system. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge Ms. Presley once again uh, and her leadership. Having been a resident of Boston many years ago and have, having worked for the Boston Juvenile Court many, many years ago, uh, Massachusetts, the Commonwealth has done a lot of great work and you have been at the forefront of that. I also want to recognize uh, the witnesses from the first panel and the one who's still here. Um, in my view, you are so powerful, and what you did today made you and your three um, colleagues at the first panel the most powerful people in Washington, D.C., and it's transformative. Um, having had this experience in multiple generation of um, addiction and abuse um, in my, in my, with my parents, um, uh, with my siblings and with children in my family, um, I have visited this issue as a personal issue and a private issue. I'm reminded sitting here uh, with this panel many years ago when I was a county supervisor and, and uh, then Governor Pete Wilson, a Republican, introduced the California Continuum of Care for Children and Families and an advocate at one of the hearings saying, this is like a metaphor for there's a group of parents by the side of a rushing river and children, young children are drowning in the river going downstream. And the parents, the adults, kept jumping in the river, saving one at a time. And then finally, one of the parents said, somebody needs to go upstream and find out why these kids are going in the stream. And 30 years later, I still think of that. So in this context of knowing the 30 years when, since my father took his life to now, we are at this inflection point. The exponential research Dr. Harry and I talked about yesterday, being from the Bay Area, we talk about Moore's Law and technology. The research in neuroscience puts that to shame. I tell my kids when we look back at this period of time, when they do, when their kids, they will look at us as both barbaric but as transformative if we do what we need to do. So we know with the ACA and with parity, uh, we have 
75% more requests for referrals, even with this broken infrastructure. But to the point from a gentleman, about 25% less people going into the professional classes to serve these people. So the two things I would question Dr. Horry and Dr. Bethel in particular are costs. We talked about this yesterday when we met. The CDC says that estimates in 2015 that maltreatment of kids going upstream is $2 trillion a year in the United States. Uh, and besides the human cost that we've heard about. And for all of the examples that we heard today about people overcoming, and I would recommend Supernormals by Meg Jay, a wonderful researcher, or anything written by Kay Jamison, who's a survivor of her own suicide. The more we go upstream, it's, but we're losing people because we don't have the infrastructure to match the increasing neuroscience and evidence-based research. Now, in this, in this Congress, we were able to do bipartisan good work on evidence-based research when it came to the criminal justice system. Uh, it wasn't perfect by my standards, but we agreed that the science would inform our decision-making process. So we have that cost, and then as a survivor of cancer, I am very appreciative. I went to see my oncologist today. The cancer I have 15 years ago, I would be dead. But now I've got an extended lifetime. NIH says that $77 trillion since 1974, their research has contributed to the U.S. economy, $77 trillion, because investments in science and research. So how do we take the fact that people lose their lives 14 to 32 years sooner if they don't have the treatment they need, and then the cost, both individually and to the whole society, and then the other the examples of when we got this right, cancer being one of them, cardiovascular disease, when we accepted what you did at CDC and what people did at NIH, and then deployed it, Dr. Bethel, using the infrastructure as best we can that we have to Ms. Presley's comments about juvenile justice. Uh, recently, I was in our juvenile hall, which I was an advocate to rebuild when I was a county supervisor 15 years ago. The judges and the DA told me, it's not big enough. We're going to have to build fine other space. It's now 60% to capacity. I asked a former presiding juvenile office uh, chief who was a friend of mine, what happened? And she said, we took all of those programs that were evidence-based research, and now the kids aren't in here. They're out in the community getting the services they need, and they're not hurting themselves or anyone else. So those two things, first, Dr. Horry, how does the Congress approach this from an evidence-based research, use that research, as we did with criminal justice reform, and get to the savings in the life expectancy changing uh, in our lifetimes or sooner? Thank you. Well, I would say prevention saves lives. Um, when you look at number of adverse childhood experiences, we've seen that if you have like six or more, decreases life expectancy um, by, you know, 18 to 20 years. So I think that's one thing right there. If we can, you know, impact early on these, reverse these traumas, buffer them, that'll impact life expectancy. On our website, we have information on evidence-based programs, child parent centers and nurse family partnership. Every dollar spent on a nurse family partnership saves $6.38. I plugged in um, the chairman's uh, state of Maryland just to see what would happen if they implemented it statewide. They would save over $200 million in substantiated child abuse cases. That saves money. And you look long term, all the other um, health impacts that Dr. Bethel and Dr. Shervington talked about with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, substance use, that early investment in prevention will have that long term impact. Dr. Bethel, we're having the bells ring, so we want to go vote. Okay, great. I, I feel sorry that I've had to tell people be consulted yeah. for I something just, we clearly all want to talk about for a long time. I just want to really support your statement that this is a crisis. Um, the Children's Hospital Association has put out a report on how it's a matter of national security, what's happening even just when we look at the lack of flourishing of children and how that might play out for our adulthood. We need a stream of launch and learn supports that allow us to use the best evidence we have and create citizen science platforms and in every NIH RFP that it's about human health needing to look at this to advance the science in all of our systems and professional associations. But most importantly, healing is prevention. We are at a point in this syndemic, meaning it has escalated to a point that even if you don't have ACEs, you're impacted. And so it's all of us, and healing has to lead the pro process for prevention. Because if we offer things and they're not used because there's too much trauma, it's not going to really uh, work. But the through any door investments 
need to happen. Like we built the roadways mm -hmm. and we had to invest in those roadways so that we could build this nation. We need to build the social infrastructure and that will play out and it's time for that investment when our sciences and our lived experience can finally meet policies that pay for and invest now because we will save later and we will also have a lot more joy and well-being as a country. Well said. I think that's as good a place as any to conclude, but also say that I want to thank the chairman, uh, Mr. Cummings in particular, and again, Ms. Presley, for their interest in my colleagues on this bipartisan, very important hearing, and again to the panelists on this panel and the previous panel. So with that, um, without objection, the following statements will be part of the record, a statement on child, childhood trauma from the National Education Association and a statement from the National Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Coalition. Okay, ranking member says no, he wants to get to vote. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'd like to thank once again our witnesses for testifying, it was incredible. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you again. <laughs>